Hi, how is everybody doing today? Um, looks like Xena's camera's frozen, so we're off to a great start. So today we're taking you back to 1983, and I did my part. I crimped my hair, I got on blue eyeshadow, and fanny pack! Hello! We're going back to 1983 to discuss the case of the Ryan family um, and their murderer, Kevin Cooper. Let's see if we can fix Xena's um, cam on the fly. So how's everybody doing today? Uh, I hope you're doing great. Let's deactivate and activate and see if that works. Okay. And we've lost the Xena cam. That's wonderful. Um, so, have any of you heard of Kevin Cooper before? Kim Kardashian, of course, it's always Kim, is trying to get him out of prison. I'm not sure why. I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know what's happening with the Xena cam, guys, but uh, we may be without a Xena cam today because it is just not, it's not working. Uh, I'll, when I play a video later, I'll try to mess with it and, and um, see if I can figure it out then. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to put on a little background music and we'll get started. Oops, wrong button. It's going really well. <laughs> Let me pull up the chat and say hi to you guys before we get started. And that'll give people a chance, even though I was a little late, to get in here. It looks like we have... And the chats aren't there. Perfect. I'll just read from here. Major victory. Life to the max. Number two. Waffle Salter. I said your name correctly this time. Quest Fanning. Um... Major victory. Okay, so I didn't open the chat be ahead of time, so I can't go back and look at them right now. But if you want me to say hi to you, say something now and it will come up. Sparky's here. Hey, Sparky, we need to do that thing where we collaborate and uh, go on each other's shows because that would be fun. I know we talked about it before and there were some scheduling issues, but we should definitely get that done. I have an amazing show planned for you guys today. Um... It was a lot of work. So I heard about this case several years ago. And uh, at the time, the, the perpetrator, we'll call him, was asking for more DNA testing and wanted more tests. And, and he's innocent. He's, he's uh, said he's innocent for since he got put away in 1985. Uh, the crime happened in 1980. 82 and um he's never said that he did it so obviously let him out of jail immediately um <laughs> kim kardashian got involved with this one as usual um as she always does and uh actually went to visit him in prison in at death row in san quentin so um Tell me if the background music is, music is too loud. It always sounds louder in my headphones. And then when I turn it down to where it sounds okay in my headphones, I can't hear it on the replay, which is, I don't know. I need a producer. Speaking of producers, I have some great work that my producer did for me today in reading some of the letters that the surviving victim had written. And we'll get to those a little later, but I want to thank PJ in case he's not here later. I see him here now uh, for doing that for me. It turned out really great. And all I'm saying is, guys, get your tissues ready because this is, uh, it's heartbreaking. Um, so we're going back 1982. Everybody's got their crimped hair and their blue eyeshadow. And um, the, the Ryan family lived in a quaint little place called Chino Hills. And let's get the notes ready. In Chino Hills, California, um, it was the dad, Doug. Uh, his actual name was... Um, Franklin Douglas Ryan, but he went by Doug, so we're going to call him Doug. Uh, his wife, Peggy, 
their daughter, Jessica, their son, Josh. And uh, at, when this happened, Josh had a friend sleeping over named Chris Hughes. Um, now, Doug Franklin Douglas Ryan grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, and he was a Marine. And uh, later on in his marining career, he was military police. He suffered... Uh, uh, on the night that this happened, I'm going to just go over what happened to them at the top so you get an idea of what's what's happening here. He had 37 wounds, uh, including stab wounds, axe wounds, and a blunt object wound, which the coroner said is from the opposite side of the axe, like the, um, the, blunt, the blunt side of the axe. It was a blunt wound. So Peggy Ryan... Uh, she was a horse person, which is why they lived in Chino Hills. They had a ranch up there with a horse barn and like one of those horse rings. And they had 12 white Arabian horses at the time. But she got her for- first horse when she was 12 years old. And she was a horse person the rest of her life. Uh, she loved horses and really all animals. She wanted to be a veterinarian when she grew up, but she ended up being a chiropractor because that's what her mom did for a living. Her mom was a chiropractor. So she followed in her mom's footsteps and gave up the dream of being a um, veterinarian and was a chiropractor. Now, Doug and Peggy were married on December 20th, 1970. And in 1972, their daughter, Jessica, was born. Uh, Jessica was bo- Jessica was born um November 9th, 1972. She loved dogs and horses just like her mom. And when she grew up, she too wanted to be a veterinarian. I wonder if given the chance, if she actually would have become a veterinarian or if she would have followed in her mom and her grandmother's footsteps and been a chiropractor as well. It seems to be the trend, but we'll never know because Kevin Cooper made sure that she never had the chance to grow up. Josh Ryan was eight years old at the time, and um, he loved Star Wars, <laughs> and he also loved animals. It's a good thing all of the the whole family loved animals because they had a bunch of dogs and cats and horses. Um, they were an animal family. Chris Hughes also liked Star Wars, which is why they were best friends. Chris and uh, Josh were best friends. Even though Chris was a few years older than Josh, he was 11 years old. Um, And he had 25 wounds, including most of which were to his his hand, his head. Um, His hands were chopped almost all the way off when they found him. They were just hanging on by a thread. Um, But most of his wounds were to his his face and neck and, and throat. Did I mention um, Peggy had 32 wounds as well? All right. So that's what happened to that family. End of show. No, I'm kidding. So Kevin Cooper was born January 8th, 1958. He had a long history of crime. Um, It's kind of crazy how some of these podcasts that I've listened to over the last month while researching this case kind of brush off the fact that this guy was a serial rapist and burglar. Um, They just completely leave that part out. So um, I'm going to tell you about it. Kevin was from Pennsylvania, and when he was... um, when he was there in Pennsylvania, he was bur- burglaring houses a lot. And one of the houses that he burglarized, one of the family friends came and knocked on the door when um, when he was inside, inside burglarizing the house. So instead of like going out a window or hiding or just not answering the door, he did answer the door. And it turns out it was a 17-year-old girl. She was a high school student and he kidnapped her. He stole her car, he kidnapped her, and he raped her at screwdriver point. So instead of knife point, which he gets to later in his career, he had a screwdriver and was holding it to her throat when he violently attacked her. Um... He was sentenced to several years in prison, um, but he escaped. Uh, Kevin Cooper escaped 11 times from state custody in his lifetime. 
Uh, this was not just prisons that he would break out of. He, at one time, was sentenced to spend time in a mental facility. He broke out of there. He was in juvie. He broke out of juvie. He left group homes that he was supposed to stay at. Uh, so 11 times total, he had a history of escaping. So he escapes. He's in He's in uh, jail for this uh, violent rape. And I want to say violent rape because sometimes... Uh, the left kind of likes to blur the lines when it comes to, the, to this. They like to um, equate date rape and um, non, like when you have, when somebody has sex with somebody and they were drunk, that's the same thing as violent rape. And it's, it's all horrible, don't get me wrong, but getting too drunk and having sex with somebody is not the same thing as somebody holding a weapon to your throat and, and and raping you. It's just not the same. He was the latter type of rapist. He held people at knife points and at screwdriver point and, um, and rape, rape them. So he breaks out of a uh, prison and he goes to California to escape. He's, uh, in California. He, of course, burglarizes more houses cause that's, that's what he does. And he gets caught, uh, which he, does that a lot too because he he's not a smart criminal he's not one of those you know bdk type of guys who went unnoticed for 20 years or however long it was um he gets sentenced to go to the california institute for men in chino chino hills uh which is where all this takes place when uh when Kevin Cooper was arrested, he didn't have any ID with him, and he told him he told them that his name was David Troutman. Uh, so David Troutman's in in jail in Chino, not Kevin Cooper. So David David Troutman, uh, the day after he gets there, walks through a hole in the fence and escapes again. Um, in a lot of the podcasts that I've listened to, I'm going to be saying that a lot, and I have lots of clips of them too, because these people are idiots, and you have to see it. You have to see it to believe it. Um, he he didn't just lazily stroll out of a hole and walk down the street. He slipped through a hole in the fence and then ran and hid in a lumber yard and waited till it was nighttime. He made his way to a neighborhood, which is uh, where he ends up next door to the Ryans. He founds a he finds a vacant house. Um, this wasn't. Um, it wasn't like a vacant house as in, um, it was a vacant house as in nobody lived there. It was a rental house uh, owned by Mr. Lease, uh, but he did not live there. He was leasing it. He was in between tenants at the time. So it was furnished. Uh, it, it wasn't one of the, it wasn't just empty is what I'm trying to get at. It was completely furnished. There was TV, the phone was still working, heat was on. It was like move in ready, fully furnished home in Chino Hills, California. <laughs> Um, the lease house I'm going to put it up here so you can kind of see what we're talking about here here it is okay so I don't think I can make that bigger, but this is the Ryan's home right here, if you can see my cursor, and the lease house is right here. So it's next door, but there's lots of land out there. So it's not like next door, next door. There's It's 125 yards away. My allergies are really kicking in today, guys, so we're gonna do our best to not sniffle in the microphone, but you know me. I think everybody who's here has been here before. You know what's going to happen. I'm going to forget to mute and I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> uh, so he's in his uh, in the lease house and um, the Ryans are just living their life over here. So 125 way, uh, yards away from the Ryan residence. Let's see. Oh, okay. So I gave you Kevin Cooper's background. I'm going to play you this first video of these idiots. Now, throughout this program today, I have lots of little clips because what has happened in this case, and I'll dig into it a little more later, um, a gentleman, 
wrote an article, an opinion piece. It's an opinion piece for the New York Times. And what has happened is every um, e-thought and true crime person on the internet has done a book report on this article that was written. It's just parroted over and over and over again. And they, of course, sometimes add their their own stuff into it and and things like that uh but for the most part it's a book report on the article so here's the first one uh this is from a podcast called true crime garage and the way that these two try to downplay the fact that this guy is a violent rapist made me sick when I listened to it. So Kevin Cooper was adopted as a baby. He suffered an abusive and troubled childhood in Pennsylvania. He would run away from home at a very young age. Later, he said that this was to escape beatings. The trouble he got into as a child involved shoplifting and marijuana charges. He never graduated from high school. Uh, Kevin Cooper really got into trouble. This was in Pennsylvania when he stole a car from a teenage girl. Now, apparently, apparently the girl interrupted him while he was committing this. Um, he was committing some form of residential burglary. Okay. She interrupts him committing this crime. He then steals the car, but he he also took the girl with him. And Kevin Cooper would later admit forcing the 17-year-old girl into the vehicle. Now, she says that he also hit her, he threatened her, he threatened to kill her, and that he had raped her. Hmm. He flatly denies hitting or raping her. Do we have any evidence of this? Um, I don't know. All I have is his statement where he admits to stealing the car and forcing her into the vehicle. I think this is a he-said-she-said situation. I don't think there was a lot of evidence to point either direction. And then you have a guy that is willing to admit to some of the charges, uh, you know, right. Unfortunately, I think probably should have been charged with kidnapping a minor, but regardless of the charges, he is going to do time for this. All right. So as you can see, according to them, it's a, he said, she said it was a, he said the courts say he was guilty and he was in prison for two years for it. They proved it in a court of law. He raped the 17 year old girl. It gets my blood boiling. When I hear this sort of stuff, it gets my blood boiling. Now, don't believe all women. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it was proven in a court of law. This is not a good dude. This is not this is not one of those cases. Whew. Um, next. Yeah, I see PJ was, PJ's the one that told me about this podcast. And funnily enough, we were in uh, a meeting Friday, I think it was. And he said, hey, have you ever heard of this true crime garage podcast? And I had never heard of it. And they had just put out a two part uh, episode. This is from two days ago. So they just put out a Kevin Cooper uh, episode, uh, which was, which was kind of, um, you know, coincidental, I guess. And I listened to it. I listened to both parts. And it's basically a book report on um, Nick Kristoff's article, just like every other one, just like every other one um, that we're going to go through today. All right, back to the notes. All right, so um, Kevin Cooper had several aliases. Richard Goodman, he was born as Richard Goodman. Now, this I wouldn't consider an alias because he was adopted as a child and they, the adoptive parents changed his name, not him. Um, but he also went by David Troutman. Uh, you know, he was in jail under the David Troutman name. And then later on, he went... My notes say angle. <laughs> he went by Angel Jackson, uh, but I can't spell. So it says angle, Angel Jackson in my notes. Angel Jackson is another alias that he went by. This case is very long and in depth. So I, if I'm not paying attention to the chat, it's not that I don't love you guys. And I will um, 
take calls at the end of this, uh, if anybody has anything to say. Um, but I just want to, I want to get through it for, <laughs> for now. All right. So the crime on June 4th, 1983, the Ryan family attended a barbecue at a neighbor's house. When they were getting ready to leave the barbecue, their son, Josh, Josh asked if his friend, Chris Hughes, and another friend, Jason Blade, whose house they were at, this is where the barbecue was at, um, could come sleep over. Chris's parents agreed. However, Jason's grandmother was in town. So Jason's parents said, no, Jason can't go to a sleepover. Grandma's in town. You know, he needs to spend time with grandma. Thank goodness for that, for the small things, because I'm pretty sure that if um, Jason's grandmother hadn't been visiting that weekend, we would be talking about five dead people instead of four. Um, God was really looking out for that kid that day. I really think so. And for Josh, too. We'll get to Josh. Josh, Josh survived this uh, attack. Um, and I really believe that, um, that God was with him that day. So they get home, um, the kids go to bed, uh, Chris is sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag in Josh's room, uh, Jessica's in her bed, Peggy goes to bed, Doug stays up and watches TV until about 11 o'clock, and then sometime after midnight, between midnight and 4 a.m., they're not exactly sure of the timeline, uh, but sometime between midnight and 4 a.m., uh, Kevin Cooper came through the sliding glass door. Now, at this time, we don't know that it's Kevin Cooper. Uh, I'll let you know how we found out it was Kevin Cooper. Uh, so some, someone comes through the glass, the sliding glass door, and um, this guy had a fixed blade knife, a hatchet, and an ice pick. I've never seen an ice pick in real life. I guess it was a thing back in the 80s. We never had one. Um, so I'm not even exactly what an ice pick is used for. Um, but you know, that's what he had. He first attacked Doug Ryan while he slept, then immediately struck Peggy on the head with the hatchet, then turned his attention back to Doug. Uh, once Doug had expired, he, he, uh, started back on Peggy and killed her. Um, in between this time, like when he was attacking Doug and then switched to Peggy and then back to Doug, uh, before Peggy died, she screamed. Uh, a lot, and I woke the children up. Jessica came through uh, the door first and was immediately attacked in the doorway. When Josh and Chris heard the commotion, uh, they hid. They instead of running into the um, into the bedroom, they hid. Uh, Josh hid in the closet, and Chris under Josh's bed. And the man, whoever it may be. Uh, went into the boys' room and pulled um, Chris out from under the bed and attacked him. There's a gnat. There's a gnat in my face. It's it's going to drive me nuts. Um, so he pulls he pulls uh, Chris out, attacks him, and Chris called out to his friend Josh while he was being slaughtered, and Josh then ran towards Chris and that's when Josh was attacked as well um, for an eight-year-old that's pretty heroic right there all of this is happening and he runs towards his friend to try to to help him it just it breaks my heart this whole this whole case just really breaks my heart uh, the man stabbed Josh in the head and torso he slit Josh's throat and then hit him in the head with the axe. Then the man took two beers from the refrigerator. He drank one of them, left the empty can on the kitchen counter, and took the other one with him. Once the man was gone, Josh crawled over to his mother and then collapsed. He put four fingers into the gash in his neck, which saved his life. He, he stopped the bleeding in his neck long enough for help to arrive. I don't know if that was just out of instinct or if he knew. Uh, I know that he was a Boy Scout, so maybe he knew to do that. Uh, it may have just been pure instinct. But he fell, he uh, passed out next to his dead mother. Eleven hours later, Chris's father came to the Ryan home to pick up his son. Um, 
Chris was supposed to come home to go to church in the morning and he never he never came home. And then Josh or Chris's mom kept calling the Ryan house and nobody was answering. So finally he sent she sent the husband over there to go get the kid. Like just go over there and get him. Um Chris's dad knocked on the front door and no one answered, so he walked around to the back door and um, the sliding glass door and it was locked too but he could see inside and what he saw was just a horrific sight he said at first that he thought that paint had spilled until it clicked in his head what he was really seeing and what he was really seeing is just a slaughter of human beings He um, ran back around to the front door and broke down the front door and ran over to his son and cradled his son in his arms. Um, And he realized his son was was dead. Um, He noticed that Josh moved, so he went to call for help. But the phone in the house had been cut, so he went to a neighbor's house and called, uh, called from there. Josh was airlifted to a hospital. Um, oh, here's a little news footage of, so you can kind of see what the house looks like and stuff. Until the night of June 4th, 1983. I'm finding the 2951 English Road, 2951 English Road. After returning from a barbecue with friends, the unimaginable happened. Here's 4 DOA. It's a very brutal murder. Nothing ritualistic about it. Nothing appears to be ritualistic. Just very brutal. Floyd Tidwell was sheriff of San Bernardino County. Would you say it's among the most brutal cases you've ever had to deal with? Mm Mm-hmm. Seemed to be a frenzy involved in the killing. Doug and Peggy Ryan, both 41 years of age, had been savagely hacked to death, along with their 10-year-old daughter, Jessica, and a friend who happened to be spending the night 11-year-old Christopher Hughes. It was a massacre. That's what it was. It was a massacre, the Chino massacre. Eight-and-a-half-year-old Josh was also found in the carnage, his throat cut. But somehow... One second, just still alive. Josh had survived. Got about four paramedics working on right now. With- Josh was rushed to Loma Linda Hospital. We weren't sure that he was going to live, and... If he did live, could he tell us anything? His head was all bandaged and the little kid couldn't talk. I just felt like I died right there. Dang it. The family station wagon was gone, and it was discovered several days later in Long Beach, California, about 50 miles from Chino Hills. Um... Here's some other just uh, tidbits of information. The mom's purse was left on the kitchen counter in uh, plain sight, and there was $3.27 in cash that was also left on the kitchen counter. Um, so this obviously is on the news. So the Mr. Lease, who was leasing his house next door, decided, oh, I better go check on my property. And when he did, he realized that someone had been squatting there and someone was living in his house. So he called the police and said, hey, you guys should come over here and see, you know, what's going on uh, over here. They did a preliminary search of the house, and when they did, they found tobacco that was something that was issued to the inmates at all of California's correctional institutes. So they thought, huh, I wonder if anybody's escaped from the prison lately. And so they called the prison, and they're like, yes, David Troutman uh, escaped three days ago. So they're like, okay, well, we got to find this David Troutman guy, obviously. Um. And the police checked the phone bill as well. They put out um, an APB um, with the guy's, uh, I was going to say profile picture, 
That's not the word I'm looking for. Mugshot is the word I'm looking for. He didn't have a profile picture. They put out the guy's mugshot to, to everywhere, and it was a huge manhunt. Um, so the police checked the phone bill. Like I said, this was a house that is was like move-in ready. So um, the phone was still working. It turns out David Troutman had called three, had made three different phone calls to two different women, uh, Yolanda Jackson and Diane Williams. And so the police called these numbers and said, hey, Yolanda, Diane, who called you recently from this number? And they said it was Kevin Cooper. So that's how they found out that Kevin, that David Troutman was Kevin Cooper, actually. Um, and he had given an, an alias when he was, you know, arrested for those home invasions and burglary, burglaries. Um, so at the, once they did the preliminary search, you know, they just went and looked to make sure nobody was still there, uh, see if there's anything, you know, crazy going on over there. So they found, uh, and then obviously they went back. Um, I actually wasn't sure exactly how police stuff worked. So, uh, you know, how um, in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you can phone a friend. I phoned a cop. Yes, <laughs> I have a friend who is a retired Chicago police uh, officer. I'm not sure if he was a detective. Should have asked. Uh, but I know he was a Chicago cop for a very long time, and he's retired now, and I called him. And from what I understand from our conversation, what usually happens is the police go in to a crime scene, and they look around to make sure there's nothing, um, you know, that either stands way out or is a danger. And then they call in lab techs and detectives and, and people like that. So once they called the lab techs and the, the actual people who do the investigations, they found a blood-stained button that was identical to buttons that they had on jackets issued at the prison. Um, and say we just put escape from tests revealed the presence of blood in the Lisa's shower bathroom sink and rug uh, there was bloody footprints in the hallway and the footprints uh, which there was also footprints at the ryan's house the footprints um matched the shoes that were issued to prisoners also were in kevin cooper's size so uh the, the thing about these footprints which the left the left i want i don't know if it's it's true crime pod, podcasters that don't do their research i don't know if they're on the left or right but one of the things that they'll say is that these shoes were not exclusive to prisons they were like keds they were specific kind of keds that were issued to the prisoners and you could go into sports authority or Foot Locker or whatever and buy these same shoes very true um but they were also issued to prisoners and also they were in his size uh the sheath from the hatchet was on the floor next to where kevin was sleeping um oh I don't know how to say this nicely. There was, um, so when Kevin Cooper got out of prison, he needed to, or he wanted to, um, he couldn't find a girl. So he manually excreted DNA onto a blanket. Let's put it that way. Although DNA wasn't a thing, but they found that on a blanket where he was sleeping. You guys get what I mean, right? I don't want to have to say it. There was burrs, um, like vegetation burrs, that were from a plant that was in between the two houses on Jessica's nightgown and also on the bedding at the Lee's house. Okay. We're going to go into the inculpatory evidence because I have it listed out in bullet points instead of a paragraph, which will be very much easier for me to go through. Um, 
roll right tobacco, which is provided to the inmates uh, at the correctional the correctional facility. Um, roll right tobacco is not available for sale. It is only available to prisoners in the California. I mean, maybe other jails too, or whatever. But in the in the California system, that's what they provided to the inmates was roll right tobacco. They found roll right tobacco not only at the lease home but also in the car that they found in Long Beach. A bloody shoe print at the Ryan home, both inside on a sheet and outside on a spa cover. The shoe matching the prison-issued Pro-Keds dude tennis shoes and in the size given to Kevin Cooper um, when he was in intake at the, at the prison. The same bloody footprints was inside the, the hallway at the Lee's house. Now, back in 1983, they didn't have DNA, but they had blood typing and the blood type matched the victims. Missing from the lease house, you know, the Mr. Lease, they ask him, hey, is anything missing? Did he take anything? Um, what was missing from his house was an ice pick, a knife, and a hatchet. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, the hatchet was found outside of, uh, it was found outside, like along the road that goes to their, the, to the homes. Um, and it had blood and skull fragments matching the blood type of Doug and Josh. The victim's blood was found on the sink, shower, uh, and rug, I think I said that already, and the button, the prison-issued button with blood on it was also find, found at the house. A drop of blood, which uh, is the evidence number is A41, was found inside the Ryan home and it matched Kevin Cooper's blood type. Uh, Kevin Cooper's blood type was A negative, which only 6% of the population have. So it's a it's it's not the rarest blood type, but it is a rare blood type, and uh, it was found inside the Ryan's home, and none of them had that blood type. A T-shirt was found on the side of the road, headed towards the interstate, that had blood on it that was consistent with the victim's blood. Josh Ryan described the killer as a dark, shadowy figure with big, bushy hair. A beer can with the victim's blood on it, was found halfway in between the Ryan house and the Lee's house. So here's the houses again. So this here in between the Ryan house and the Lee's house is where the, that vegetation with those burrs on it was and also where they found the beer can with the, that um, Josh said he saw the guy take from the refrigerator and also um, had left one at the house and one was found like he drank it while he was walking back to this house to clean up um josh ryan described the killer as a dark shadow shadowy figure with big bushy hair we'll get to that i have a video of him saying that too all right so there was a manhunt let me play the video of Josh saying hold hold up hold up wait a minute hmm all right let me see if I can find this video because I thought I had it queued up Maybe it will get to it, I guess, eventually. I thought I had put them all in order. All right, so manhunt ensues. After the murders, Kevin Cooper went back to the lease house, took a shower, collected his belongings, and left in the Ryan station wagon. He drove the Ryan station wagon to Long Beach, where he abandoned it in a church parking lot. In the station wagon, there were cigarette butts. Um, both of the prison-issued kind, and then also Mr. Lease had a pack of Viceroy cigarettes that was taken from his house. So there was Viceroy cigarettes in, in the car as well. Uh, the victim's blood was in three different places in the car. 
in the front seat and in the back seat. So the victim's blood was all over the inside of the car. Cooper checked into a hotel in Tijuana about 130 miles south of Chino Hills at 4.30 on June 5th, so a couple of days later. There he befriended a couple, an American couple, Owen and Angelica, Angelica is what I have down, not Angelina, Angelica Handy. Uh, So Mr. and Mrs. Handy owned a boat and he was offered a job as a deckhand. Uh, He told them his name was Angel Jackson. Uh, The Handys saw um, Cooper, uh, when they questioned them afterwards, they saw him in possession of numerous items that were later identified as items that were stolen from the lease house. The Handys also found it strange that when they were in port, so he hired them. Can you believe also I don't have a map up again? This is like the second week in a row that I didn't pull a map up. What's wrong with me? So when they would go to port. Okay, so here we are. He, they were in Ensenada. Where's Ensenada? So they met in Tijuana and they had their boat in Ensenada. So they went down to their boat in Ensenada and their plan was to take the boat from Ensenada to um, San Francisco and they hired him as a deckhand. So they're stopping at all these little ports along the way. They're just going up the coast, stopping at different ports. And every time they would stop at a port, he wouldn't get off the boat. He would never leave the boat. And even one time they said he they invited him to come to a restaurant like that was right there in in the marina to eat dinner and he wouldn't go he just stayed on the boat and like i don't know ate a sandwich or something i don't know um the couple heard on the radio about a manhunt for this kevin cooper guy however they didn't uh, suspect angel jackson because the broadcast never gave a description of the wanted man They didn't say his age or race or height, nothing. They just said, we're looking for a guy named Kevin Cooper. So they they had no idea. They're like, oh, no, this is Angel Jackson, different guy. Um, So they get to Santa Barbara, which is just north of L.A. And this genius... Okay, so they get to a port in Santa Barbara, and Angel Jackson, Kevin Cooper, uh, the couple leaves the boat, goes to do their shopping, whatever they're doing, and he jumps onto another boat and rapes a woman at knife point. Yes, he did it again. He, this is a month later, he rapes a a 26-year-old woman at knife point. So the woman goes to the police station to report the violent rape and sees Kevin Cooper's wanted poster. And she's like, oh my God, that's the guy that raped me. That's him. I know where he is. Come get him, boys. So the cops go to the marina. She knows what boat he's from. Like, you know, he works on the boat. So he knows, she knows where he is. When, (laughs) this is how he gets arrested. It's kind of hilarious. So when um, they get to the boat, they're walking up the little boat ramp or the dock and um, he sees them coming. He throws something shiny in the water and then dives in the water. The police had to rescue him because um, he wasn't that great of a swimmer for some reason. I don't know why, but he was not a great swimmer. And so they arrest him. And then they have divers go down to see what he threw in the water. It was a knife. He threw a knife into the water. So disposing of evidence. So when he gets to the police station he admits to escaping from prison and to living in the lease house but he says he did not have anything to do with that murder nothing to do with it well what the hell you know about it Capone what are you in for (laughs) lawyer fuck me Everybody 
Everybody's innocent in here. Don't you know that? <laughs> Everybody's innocent. Um, back to my story. <laughs> uh, yes, News Now Enemy, it is going to be a long show tonight. It's a lot. There's like side quests. It's like, yeah, it's a lot. Um, all right, so how all this started. Give me one second. I got to, I have something in the wrong spot in my notes. And if I don't fix it, dang it. Oh, that's fine. Um, so Nicholas Kristoff wrote, and this is how all of, this is how all of these people ended up getting on this bandwagon. Is Nicholas Kristoff wrote an entire article after reading the dissenting opinion from the Cooper versus Brown case written by Judge William A. Fletcher of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And if you're wondering, uh, Nicholas Kristoff, do I know that guy? You do know that guy. And you're going to be surprised where you know him from. Do you all remember when Ben Affleck and Sam Harris were on Bill Maher? He was the other guy that was there. He was there that day. It's not, but the picture you're painting That's Nick is to some extent true, but is hugely incomplete. It is certainly true that plenty of fanatics and jihadis are Muslim, but the people who are standing up to them, Malala, uh, incredible Malala's Muhammad Ali uh, yes. Dadak in, in Iran, in prison for nine years for speaking up for Christians, uh, a friend that I had in Pakistan who was shot this year, uh, Rashid Rahman, for defending people accused of okay. apostasy. Nick, or how about the more than a billion those, people those who are aren't fanatical, yeah. who don't punish well, women, who just want to go to the store? Okay. Wait a second. 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 All right, so that's Nick Kristoff. Uh, Nick Kristoff is a writer for the New York Times. He's a Jewish man. He has a lisp. This is who we're dealing with. So the free Kevin Cooper talking points. We're going to go through these. And uh, give me one second. So the sheriff in this case, Sheriff Tidwell, we saw him um, in that first little video that I showed. In 2004, he pled guilty to a misdemeanor of taking over 500 guns from an evidence locker. He would add them to his collection. He would give them out as gifts. He never took anything that was involved in an active case. And most of the guns that he took were scheduled to be destroyed. He was a fan of old guns. He was a fan of unusual guns. So these are the things that he took. And only when he was like about to like put them into the wood chipper or whatever they do to destroy guns, melt them down, I guess. So instead of melting them down, he would take them home and add them to his collection. So this is... This happened in 1983, and 2004 is when, when he pled guilty to a misdemeanor of taking, you know, taking stuff out of the evidence locker. He got a $10,000 fine and spent one day in jail. Uh, sadly, Sheriff Tidwell died in 2020 at the age of 90. Three white men is the next talking point. It could not have been Kevin Cooper. It had to be three white men who did this. Um, let's see. This is Sunday. Okay, here's the... Um, Here's the interview that was in the wrong order that I couldn't find a minute ago. This is Josh Ryan uh, after he's been healed and um, says what actually happened. And I'll tell you why they're saying three white men in, in a minute. Um, but let's play this first. Let's play this first. December 9th, 1984, about 3.30 in the afternoon. We're here at the home and her grandson, Josh Ryan. I'd like to take you back for just a moment to that Saturday before your mom and dad and Chris and Jessica were killed. Did somebody come up to your place looking for work? Yes. And who was that? My Mexican. 
did those uh, three Mexicans talk to anyone? Yeah, I talked to my dad. And then you came back home after the party at, or the barbecue at the Blade House, right? Yes. And then you went to sleep? Yes. What was the next thing that you can remember? When? After you went to sleep. Waking up again. And what caused you to wake up this time? Could you recognize the voice of the scream? No. Did you hear any sounds in the house after you got Chris up and started to walk down the hall? No. Any screams? Any yells from anybody? Any words? Nothing? No. Did you ever see anybody in the house that didn't belong there? You can't really tell at night because you know, it could be anyone. It could well, be my mom or something. And when you say it could have been someone like your mom, who are you talking about or what did you see that? I don't know, really like saw almost like the shadow or something. Where did you see the shadow? Like the, the, um, the bathroom's here. I saw it right like, on the bathroom. How many shadows did you see? Just one. Just the one? So that's what Josh Ryan has to say. The reason why they say three white men is earlier in the day, what happened was that three Mexican guys, and you heard Josh say that, came to the house asking for work. This is before the barbecue. This is before anything happened. And um, when Josh was in the hospital, he couldn't speak. So the way they were questioning him was having him squeeze the guy's hand, like whoever was talking to him, the cop or whatever. They, they're like, squeeze my hand once for yes, twice for no. Well, when the cop asked him, like, how many people were there, he was talking about the three Mexicans that came to his house earlier in the day. He was not talking about when it happened. Uh, the reason they want to say this is because, uh, and he never says white men ever, 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 but they just keep, they keep repeating the same, the same um, thing. They keep saying the same thing. It's like they're, it's like copying somebody's homework, but they got the answers wrong. Nicholas Kristoff says three white men when actually it was three Mexican guys. And also it wasn't three Mexican guys that they were talking, that Josh was talking about. And as soon as he could speak, he clarified what he meant. He, Kevin Cooper never turned on the lights. He never saw Kevin Cooper's face. Another point of contention is that when Kevin Cooper was on the television, Josh couldn't identify him. His grandmother asked him, like, is that the guy? And he's like, I don't know. Because he never saw the guy. All he saw, as he said in this interview, is a shadowy figure with big bushy hair. Shadowy figure, big bushy hair. Now, you tell me. Could this be him? I think so. He never said anything about three white men, and it drives me nuts that they keep going back to this. He, when, when he squoz, squoz, squeezed the guy's hand, he was... He was in a state of shock, A. He just witnessed his entire family get slaughtered. And he was thinking, oh, that was strange. It doesn't usually happen that three guys come over to the house. So maybe they had something to do with it. So he was trying to uh, tell the cop that there's these three guys that came earlier. Maybe they had something to do with it. And Josh clarifies this once he can speak. to work on this case because okay this <laughs> this guy <laughs> um three weapons were used and obviously how on earth could this is the dumbest point i've ever heard in my life how could it have been only one guy when he had three weapons because even if he was ambidextrous you only have two hands you only have two hands so how could it be three weapons because I want to answer questions for her. For instance, 
How did one man, Kevin Cooper, overwhelm five people? It's just hard for me to believe that one person did all that. One of the reasons Dr. Mary really believes that there was more than one assailant, she will describe her daughter Peggy as a fighter. She was strong. She didn't think she'd just roll over. And Peggy's husband, Doug, was no pushover either. Six foot, about 180. He was strong. He was an MP in the Marines. How did one person chase all these people down? Doesn't make sense. But even more troubling to Ingalls is that the injuries were caused by at least three weapons. Trial Exhibit 42, this is the hatchet. The hatchet and a knife and an ice pick, which were never found. Uh, I guess he was wearing a, like a utility belt of murder weapons when he entered the residence. He's got two hands, okay? Dennis Kottmeyer's explanation? He's ambidextrous. He could use either hand equally well, ambidextrous. That's really a great philosophy, except for one little fact. There was three weapons, and I don't care how ambidextrous you are, you can't hold three. You got two hands. Was Obviously, there couldn't have been one person because nobody has three hands, guys. Don't you know that? No one has three hands. Oh, thank you for letting me know. I will turn up the volume on the videos. My apologies for that, and I appreciate you guys letting me know when stuff like that happens. Um... Only two hands, guys. Let's break down what doesn't make sense in the coroner's report. Kevin Cooper, a 155-pound malnourished man on the run for two... We added in malnourished now. That's her own... She. I didn't see that anywhere else, that he was malnourished. <laughs> so <laughs> how could a guy who's 155 pounds, who apparently now is malnourished, we're just making stuff up as we go along. These are the ethos I was talking about. Two days could not simply have enough strength to overpower Doug, a 200-pound ex-Marine with guns and arms reach. Who was asleep when he was attacked? Two shirts were found on the side of the road and a shirt covered in blood, not matching Kevin's. At the same time, attacking a family, him having time to change shirts and then change into two other shirts, leaving the Kenyan Coral Bar. So this is what I was talking about, these people doing book reports on the article. <laughs> like, this was obviously uh, somebody's book report. Pause game strunk, by the way. Here's one more three hands video for you guys. There are questions about how one man was able to overwhelm five people, one of whom, 41-year-old Douglas Ryan, was an ex-Marine. There were three murder weapons, a hatchet, a knife, and an ice pick. Three weapons would be difficult for a single person to use all at once. Two witnesses say they saw three... I mean, how are you going to have three weapons? How is that even possible? Um, so, three weapons, three white men, three white men, three white men. The reason why they also said three white men is because there's a bar down the street from the Ryan house. Um, called the uh, Corral something bar. Canyon Corral Bar. And there's a woman who came forward 10 years later, 10 years later, who said that um, she was at the bar that night because she remembers 10 years ago being at the bar a specific night. And that, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe he had a fanny pack. It was the 80s. He had a fanny pack for his ice pick. <laughs> um so she's at the bar and she sees three guys come in from the back of the bar and um, I should close tabs as I'm going through them so I don't have to do this every time. Um, so she's at the bar and she sees three guys come in from the back that are covered in blood, just absolutely covered in blood. And she's like, oh, I, I, she didn't know about the murders at the time. So she thought maybe they were slaughtering pigs or something like that. It was three white men, three white men, three white men. Don't forget three white men. Um, anyway, so back to my story. Uh, the also, there was people who saw three people in a station wagon. 
around the area. There was three people in a station wagon and there was, uh, there's definitely um, witnesses to that. Here's the thing. The people in the bar who were, and I, I, where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I want to read this to you verbatim. Um, oh, it's because I didn't put it in my notes. I put it over here. Canyon Corral Bar. Here we go. So, uh, employees who worked at the Canyon Corral Bar the night of the murders testified at the original trial. So this woman who came, comes in 10 years later, are we going to believe her or the people who were questioned at the time who actually testified at the trial? Um, the bartender, Ed Lico, Lelko, uh, was called to testify at the trial by Cooper's original attorney. Letko, Lelko, I, whatever his name is, the bartender testified three men entered the bar the night of the murders, but left the bar after being refused service because they were too drunk. He did not notice any blood. None of the persons originally known by law enforcement to be in the Canyon Corral bar, by the way, that woman was not known at the time to have even been at the bar that night. Um, there's no evidence. She didn't have a receipt. Nobody saw her there. Uh, she saw on a news uh, coverage that he was about to be executed and then came forward with this story. Uh, none of the persons originally known by law enforcement to be at the Canyon Corral bar that night, the night of the murders, noticed any blood on the three white men. Three white men, three white men. Those persons were interviewed by law enforcement during the original investigation um, and at least two testified at Cooper's trial. Cannon Corral employees and patrons who either were interviewed after the murders or testified at the trials included Ed Lelko, the bartender, Shirley Killigan, the manager, Kathleen Royals, a waitress, Virginia Mansfield, another waitress, Lester Land, the maintenance man, and Linda Polk. Um, and... I had to take a screenshot of that and I accidentally cut it off. So that's that. Um, but the point is all of these people who were known by law enforcement to have actually been there that night, they were actually there, were proven to be there, saw the three white guys. The three white guys were too drunk. They turned them away and nobody noticed any blood on them. So this three white men bullshit is just that it's bullshit. Um, music. <laughs> Sheriff Tidwell, we talked about him. Three weapons, we talked about that. Um, so these people who are saying that obviously... Kevin Cooper was one person and there's no way he could have overpowered a Marine and his wife, who was also very fit and in shape, failed to realize they were asleep. They were asleep and the patio door was unlocked. There was no loud noise of him breaking in that would have woken them up. Cooper attacked Doug first. When Peggy screamed, he bashed her and then went back and killed Doug and then killed Peggy. That's how it happened. So basically debunked. Okay, the three people in the station wagon. Uh, there was reports, two different people reported seeing a station wagon with three people in it. One of them, the station wagon cut them off. So that's why they remember it was three people in a station wagon. That backed up Josh's story. They found blondish brown hair clenched in Jessica's hand as if torn out in a struggle. They also determined the killers used three weapons on everyone in the family. A hatchet, an ice pick, and one or two knives. The family, the family station wagon was also missing and as the investigation progressed, several witnesses reported seeing three white men driving a similar car that night. 
In fact, several other witnesses reported seeing three disorderly white men at the Canyon Coral Bar on the night of the murders, not too far from the Ryan home. They had blood on their clothes and they left in a car similar to the missing station wagon. North of the bar, police recovered a tan, blood-stained t-shirt discarded on the side of the road. So, here's my point. In 1983, let's just, let's take a, let's, let's ask in the chat. And if you were, if you're old like me, do you remember 1983? And I want you to tell me how many families or how many people do you know that drove station wagons in the 80s? Uh, because for me, it was a lot. A lot of my friends, um, had large families. I grew up in a Catholic community. I went to Catholic school. Um, they all had station wagons. We had a suburban because there was a more of us than most of the families around us. Um, so we needed a larger car than a station wagon. Uh, but the first minivan ever to be released to the public for public sale was in 1983 and it was released by dodge caravan released one and chrysler voyager released that one it was basically the same car with different branding on it or whatever that didn't happen until 1983 so my point is to see three people in a station wagon it's like it would be like saying um today i saw three people in an suv well, yeah, everybody drives an SUV. So not surprising that somebody saw three people in, in a station wagon in the area, in any area in 1983. Okay, so this video that I just showed kind of touched on the blonde hair that was clenched in Jessica's hand. There's a photo of it. I'm not going to show it because... You get the idea. It's a little hand. It's got hairs grasped in it when, when she uh, passed away. When she was brutally murdered. Let's put it that way. Um, and obviously, Kevin Cooper did not have blonde hair. So there had to be three white men there instead of Kevin Cooper. So then why was significant evidence brushed away? Why did nobody want to talk about the fact that Josh's sister Jessica had a fistful of blonde hair in her hand that appeared as though she had gotten out of somebody's head during a struggle? It didn't match Jessica, it didn't match Kevin, so who could this have belonged to? Possibly another killer? This was the main reason why many were starting to have doubts that Kevin was the killer. And a lot of people were coming forward saying that the night of the murder, Witnesses at a local bar saw three white men coming in with blood on their clothing. They were being rowdy and three white men even talked to one of the men and told him, you have blood on your clothes. And he didn't even know it was there. Then a couple saw three white men driving a station wagon out of town that night. And another witness said that this station wagon almost crashed into her car and she wrote down the license plate. And when she heard that a station wagon was missing, from the Ryan family home, she realized that the license plate was the same. But the Ryan family wasn't in it that night because they were. So after, uh, this is a, another little tidbit of information. After it was released to the public, the license plate number they were looking for, this person came forward and said, that's the car I saw, that's the license plate I saw. Come on, people. We're gonna let a murderer out of, like, let me just bring up a couple of photos so you can see what we're dealing with here. This is what we're talking about. This guy did this. He did this. And they want to let him out of prison, not even just take him off of death row, which there's a moratorium on right now anyway. Um, but like, this is, this is what we're talking about here. This person who did this, they want to let out of prison. It makes me so angry for those of you that are just listening i'm i'm showing crime scene photos right now of blood splattered everywhere in this family's home um it's just it's a massacre it's a massacre Whew. gotta put on the peaceful music again to bring my blood pressure down 
uh, Zena's being so cute right now, and I'm so sorry that I cannot get her camera working. Uh, next video break, I will, uh, I will try to get it working. They want to let him out of prison, guys. What do you think of that? I hope somebody decides to call in today, because I really want to talk about this. Uh, I'm going to go through and debunk all of this stuff. Um... But, spoil, spoiler alert, after the 18th time they asked for more testing, they asked for testing on the hair. Um, the hair was a mixture of human hair and dog hair. The human hair was cut on both ends, as if somebody got a haircut in the house. Also, because there was no um, roots on the hair, they couldn't do regular DNA testing, but they could do mitochondrial DNA testing, which came back to matching the family. So somebody on the mother's side of the family, that's whose hair it was. That's the blonde hairs that every single person who is doing a book report on this article is parroting. They haven't looked at any of the... Like, there's... There's pages and pages of information on this case. They didn't bother to read any of it. They read, or they probably didn't even. Christoph, uh, Nick Christoph read the dissenting opinion, by the way. The dissent, not, not the one that went through, the one of the person that disagreed. He read that opinion and wrote an article about it. And all these people are, are backing this, including Kim Kardashian, which we'll get to her in a minute. Okay. Next talking point done by, like, this is the free Kevin Cooper talking points. Evidence was planted. Every time they do testing and they find out that it belongs to Kevin Cooper, it was planted. They planted blood at the Ryan house. They planted footprints at the Ryan house. They planted footprints at the Lease house. They planted a bloody button. They planted a bloody shirt. They planted cigarette butts. They planted everything. What really happened is uh, police do a preliminary search, which I talked to my cop friend about this. They do a preliminary search and then they go back with lab tests and do a detailed search. So they're saying, well, why wasn't it found the first time? Why weren't the cigarette butts found the first time? The first time they, they went to the car, the first time they were looking to make sure it was the uh the 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 ryan's car they were looking to make sure there wasn't dead bodies in the trunk they weren't going through and and picking cigarette butts out now along with that we talked earlier about cigarette buds being found in the car the family okay so this woman first of all this video has 314,000 views this video right here. So this is what we're up against. These people are getting the ears of everyone and they're spewing nonsense. Okay, so she keeps saying cigarette buds and it really is driving me nuts. So cigarette buds were planted. Station wagon and how they had also owned a hatchet. And when she went to go check if the hatchet was still there after the murders, when the information was released to the public, she said that Lee's hatchet was missing. Now, along with that, we talked earlier about cigarette buds being found in the car, the family station wagon, and how they had Kevin Cooper's DNA on it. These cigarette buds were not discovered in the first search of the car. It was not until the second search that these cigarette buds were recovered by police. Now, the reason that that is sketchy, so to speak, is because it makes people believe that those cigarette buds were planted. A lot of people believe that Kevin Cooper was just the easy way out in this case, and that is why authorities pinned all of this on him. And if they wanted to pin it on him even more, they could put the cigarette buds in the car. However, prosecution claimed that the reason that the cigarette buds were not discovered in the initial search of the car was because the initial search was strictly for just seeing if this car was in fact the car belonging to the Ryan family. The initial search was not done with a fine tooth comb, which is why the cigarette buds were not found until the second search. So that's what prosecution says. However, a lot of people believe that the cigarette buds were in fact planted there. But there was also a So a woman who says cigarette buds has 614,000 views on this video alone. This woman <sighs> uh, 
Um, this shirt that uh, happens to be conveniently held up here was found on the side of the road uh, in between the, the, the Ryan and Lee's house and the highway. It was like thrown out of the window. So there was blood on it that did match Doug Ryan's blood. There was also, they wanted to have, um, like, touch DNA done it, done it. Now, no DNA was invented back then. And touch DNA wasn't invented till recently. Um, but, uh, spoiler for you guys, the blood belonged to the Ryan family and the sweat belonged to Kevin Cooper. There's videos that have been made recently. Like, this information has been out. These tests have been done, and the these people are still just taking that article from Nicholas Kristoff and running with it. They have not even looked to see if the if it has come back, like if the the tests have come back. On June fourth, Kevin hitchhiked to Mexico and was working on a sailboat in Tijuana when the family's car was retrieved in Lee's stepmother's home. Blood was found in the driver, passenger, and back seat inside the car, indicating three people. Okay. <laughs> um, Dominica's book report says that if blood was in the passenger seat, in the driver's seat, and in the back seat, obviously it was three white men. Um, my counter to that is that he was living in this car for two days. So he probably moved around in the car. It was a station wagon. There's lots of room in there. I'm assuming he probably slept in the back seat. I'm assuming that he had stuff of his that he put into the passenger seat. There's perfectly good explanation for why the blood would be found in not just the driver's seat. Does she think that he got into the driver's seat at the Ryan house and, um, that's it? He just stayed there the whole time? I had to back up so you guys can see my fanny pack. Oh, that's where I keep my ice pick, you know. Um, it's every single one of them, guys. Every single one of them. I found one video. I don't... Fate of the Union is the name of the channel. Fate of the Union. I want to kind of talk to that guy and see if I can get him on the show because he's the only one that I found that's on YouTube, that is. Now, on other platforms, Devin Tracy has a great series about this case that goes very much, it, it, it's a five-part series. They're each about an hour long, and it's very well done. He knows how to edit. I do not. So, um Obviously, his work is way better than mine, but he's another one that goes into detail about why Kevin Cooper is totally guilty. Um, so fate of the union. I'll put a link, uh, like I said, in the description to his channel because he seems to have a solid head on his shoulders. Um, next point by the defense everyone is racist the police focused on kevin cooper because he's black and they're white and they're racist the jury also racist the judge racist everyone's racist the protesters very racist when kevin cooper was arrested and tried the atmosphere was racially charged killed a nigger electrocute him the people were actually standing outside the courthouse carrying these signs, screaming at us. That was scary. We kept wondering, is it safe for us to even be here? But we knew we had to be there for Kevin. I think the more... So everyone's racist, so that's the only reason. Now keep in mind, these uh, police officers have... There's no motive for him to lie about Kevin Cooper. There's zero motive except obviously if they're racist that's their motive but do you think that this the lab techs and the police officers and the jury and the judge and the prosecution team all these people are going to risk their careers their livelihood the way they feed their family just to put this guy in into into prison to to put him on death row are they going to um 
risk everything, everything just for this one guy? I don't think so. I think that's a little far fetched. All of these tabs I have up here, all of these people don't think that that's far fetched at all. They think that they're that everyone's racist. Uh, next point on the defense's side, Kevin Cooper was abused as a child. Even if he was abused as a child, how on earth does that make a difference? Why does that matter? Also, I don't think he was abused as a child. And the same interview that we were watching a second ago, this is his sister talking. And this is the reason I don't think that he was abused as a child. Our dad was very strict. If my dad said, don't do a certain thing, he meant don't do it. Well, Kevin would do it anyway. And then he would get a whipping. We got whippings when we were little. Okay, anybody of the same age bracket as me did not get whippings as a child because that's just how it was back then. So she's telling us that uh, when she was a kid, when you broke the rules, you got a whipping. That's not abuse. And it's certainly not abuse back then. Maybe today that would be considered abuse. I'm not sure. I'm not a kid anymore. I do know that the threat of violence was always there. You followed the rules or you got a whooping. Kevin Cooper and this nice woman here um, were adopted. So I'm to believe that a couple wanted a family so badly that they adopted Kevin Cooper and then whooped him. Now, I know that it happens. I know that this can happen, but I really highly doubt it in this case. Also, like I said before, even if it did happen, even if he was horribly abused as a child, how does that matter? It does not matter at all, not even for a minute. Okay, now we're getting into it. So the tests came back. They asked for tests on um, the, the blood. They wanted DNA tests. So finally, Kevin gets his wish and he gets DNA tests done. Now, the defense picks what to test. So you would think he would not have DNA tests done um, on stuff that he knows was his, but he's not that smart. So the tests come back, the blood on the shirt was his. The, um, the blood A41, that one drop of blood that was in the Ryan's house that he said he had never been in the Ryan's house, that one drop of blood was his. Not only did it test for his blood type, which we knew at the time, it also was a possibility of one in 80 gorillion or whatever the number is, that it was him. It's the only person that it would match was Kevin Cooper's. His blood was in the house. Uh, his, they, they, um, then they come back and they say, what about, uh, could you test it again for EDTA? Now, EDTA. septic acid. Who nailed it. EDTA. We're just going to go with that. Um, they test for EDCA. They come back with the test. They're like, yes, we will, for you, Kevin Cooper, test for EDTA. EDTA is found, it's a preservative that's found in the purple top test tubes where they store blood so it doesn't clot. It's an anti-clotting thing. Um, so that way um, they can keep the blood. It doesn't like, you know, turn into a gel or whatever, whatever happens to blood. Um they test for it and there's EDTA on freaking everything. So Kevin Cooper didn't do it. They planted the blood. Everything's planted. I'm just kidding. EDTA is in freaking everything. So <laughs> EDTA, um, basically, it's used in, it's a water softener, it's used in medicine, it's used in eye drops, it's used in fabric softener, it's used in laundry detergent, it's used in, did I say lotion? If you have lotion on, you have EDTA on your skin right now, it is in everything. So the fact that there's EDTA in the blood that they tested means 
jack nothing. It means nothing at all. There's no, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's literally in everything. Look up EDTA on the internet and find me a product that EDTA, D, EDTA is not in. Um, it's literally, it, it's, it's in shampoos, it's in cleaners, personal care products, uh, hair, uh, did I say shampoo, like shampoos, conditioners, it's, it's basically in everything. So, um, this is what, when the EDTA came back and they're like, there's EDTA. So the judge, Judge Huff, summarized the results of the EDTA test um, as follows. <clears throat> if the peti petitioner's theory were correct, there would be spiked levels of EDTA in the subject stain on the t-shirt relative to the levels of ETA EDTA found in the background material. material. Dr. Ballard's testing revealed the opposite. The subject stain contains a level of EDTA lower than most controls on the t-shirt and dramatically lower than the level of EDTA expected in a tampering scenario involving a blood involving blood from a purple top tube. Boom, roasted. The EDTA means nothing. There was actually lower EDTA in the blood the part of the shirt that had the blood on it than the part of the shirt that didn't have the blood on it. So yeah, that's the EDTA situation. We started dealing drugs. Okay. So the Canyon Corral bar, three white men came into the bar near the Ryan home the night of the murders, blood on their clothes. Um, okay, I think I already went over this from my brain. The lady who came up with the story 10 years later. Yeah. Next, Lee Furrow did it. Okay, so we have another suspect, guys, and he's white, and he's got two other friends that it could have been them. Let me tell you about Lee Furrow. Lee Furrow. Um, well, let's let's play this introduction of Lee Furrow first. This is Lee Furrow's ex-girlfriend speaking. It was a life of drugs, sex, and guns. And Diana says Furrow was a particularly violent man. His rage, he, he had no control over it. He was just, he had no control. She remembers clearly the early hours of June 5th, 1983, the morning after the Ryans were killed. And it was like early, early morning. A car pulled up. Diana recalls Lee Furrow and another woman coming into the house. I mean, when they came to the door, you could feel something just eerie, real horrible. And Lee wearing coveralls. He went into the room, into the closet, and he dropped the coveralls. Two days later, she was cleaning her closet. And I looked down, and here was these coveralls. And I picked them up. And as I picked them up, the more I picked them up, then I saw the blood. And there's more. So not what he left in. I laid his clothes out for him. It was like a beige, light brown colored t-shirt. Remember the t-shirt police found near the crime scene? Just DNA the sweat off the t-shirt. That's all I got to say. Diane says well, Lee Furrow DNA was wearing DNA. one just like it. When it came on the news that they'd found a t-shirt, okay, I called. She called the sheriff's office about her suspicions. Two cars, I remember two cars came out and gave deputies the bloody coveralls she found. And they took them, they laid them over on the car, on the police car. The coveralls were taken into evidence, so why weren't they sent to a lab for blood testing? And would they have implicated Lee Furrow? We'll never know, because three months after Diana Roper turned them in, a deputy sheriff threw them away. Wouldn't you say that? All right, so let me tell you about uh, Diana Roper. This is a fun story. Um, Diana Roper, let's put her picture up here. Um, this is Diana Roper. She was dating Lee Furrow in the 80s. She met him while he was in prison. Uh, Lee Furrow is a convicted murderer. We'll put that out there. Um, and she was in the prison visiting another inmate and met him and decided to date him when he got out of prison, which is great life choices, by the way. So the story that she just told, let me tell you where the story came from. This woman is a witch. 
And I'm not saying that as a ad hom. What I'm saying is she's Wiccan. And her and her friends had a seance one night. And in a trance-like state, came up with the story that she, um, saw, like, this is where this whole story came from, is that she had a seance and um, her boyfriend murdered um the, the Ryan family. So that, yeah, this is, this is where it came from. Um, also, so the bloody overalls or coveralls, it goes back and forth. She's not sure what they are, uh, had air quotes, blood stains from the knees down. First of all, there's no way that the blood, she's saying that there was blood on the t-shirt and blood from the knees down, but not in between for like, doesn't make sense. Um, also, we know now that the t-shirt came back. They did test the sweat on the t-shirt and it did come back to Kevin Cooper. Um, what else did she say? I should have taken notes. Uh, okay, so seance, she visions her boyfriend killing. Oh, Lee Furrow has an alibi <laughs> and the, his alibi is why she's saying this stuff. His alibi is that he was at a concert some 40 miles away with another woman and then after the concert they went and got a hotel in san diego which he's got receipts for the hotel he's got the ticket stub for the concert he's got the receipt for when he purchased the concert ticket so and he was cheating on her he was cheating on her this is this is where the story's coming from um I mean, I don't even really even know what else to say about it. Like this Lee Furrow guy is is on the tip of everyone's tongue. Every true crime person who has ever done a video about this, it's on the tip of their tongue. So, Lee Furrow, I'm gonna tell you more about him. This is a side quest we're about to go on about Lee Furrow. So. Uh, his girlfriend, Diana Roper, she's lovely, sees the news footage and then calls the police. She says that Lee came home that night, the night of the murders, with bloody clothes on. And also, um, she did not mention this at the time of her original call. She mentioned it after it was on the news that there was a hatchet used in the murders, that a hatchet was missing from his toolbox. The police collected the blood-stained coveralls and interviewed Diana. She admits that she's Wiccan and had a vision of all this and a group seance. The coveralls were taken into evidence. They were never tested because, according to the police, the people who collected it, the stains on the coveralls were small stains below the knees and were bright red. Now, class, tell me something. What color is blood stains after, say, a couple of days? What color are blood stains? Anybody? Anybody? They're not red, is my point. They turn brown. These were not blood stains on these coveralls. They would not have been red. I don't know what was on the coveralls, but it definitely was not uh, blood because six months later, they would not have been still red. Or, sorry, six months is when they threw them out. Um, Several weeks later, it was like a month later that she called and gave him these coveralls. They were they were still uh, bright red. Um, so the police kept them in the evidence locker, and now she did not turn these into the police that were investigating it. She uh, turned them into some sub uh, substation that was somewhere else, and the substation police called the investigators told them what they had and the investigators didn't ever come and get them because like they didn't have anything to do with this case also keep in mind at this time in la or in this area san bernardino county la county this was all over the news all the time and they had thousands upon thousands of calls of tips of people wanting to help um and she was just one of them Okay, so Lee Furrow was a convicted murderer. I did tell you that. And I'm going to tell you about his previous crime because it'll come into play here in a minute. Lee Furrow, uh, he was working as a, as a security or at a security company for a guy named Clarence 
Ray Allen. Clarence Ray Allen was a criminal and he planned to rob a grocery store, but he needed to get the security codes. So Allen's son, Roger, uh, was friends with the store owner's son. Uh, the store owner's son was named Brian Sletwich. Uh, so Roger invited Brian over to go swimming. And while they were in the pool, the dad, um, Alan, uh, Clarence Ray Allen, he stole the codes from the son's wallet for the grocery store. So uh, this is how they got the codes. They're going to rob this grocery store. By the way, they did rob the grocery store. They got $500 in cash and about $10,000 in traveler's checks. That was their haul from the grocery store robbery. Um, the night of the robbery, they decided they needed to keep Brian um, distracted so he doesn't go to the store. So Brian, Clarence Ray Allen's son, Brian's, had a girlfriend named Mary Sue Kitts. So they instructed Mary Sue Kitts to keep Brian distracted. So Mary Sue Kitts goes on a date with Brian. Um, so when Brian, the next day, finds out oh shit we got robbed i wonder if mary sue kitts has anything to do with this he confronted mary sue kitts and she immediately cracked under the pressure um and told brian everything told them about the swimming and told them how they got the security codes and said that she was there to distract him and she's really sorry and and whatever so brian confronts roger um Clarence Ray Allen's son, Roger, he confronts him and says, dude, Mary told me everything. What the heck? What are you doing? You robbed me. Roger, in turn, goes and um, and tells his dad that, like, uh, or not Roger, Brian. Okay, so, yeah, Roger goes and tells his dad, um, Clarence Ray Allen, that, look, Mary Sue Kitts told grocery store family and they know everything. So before the police could get involved, Clarence Ray Allen told Lee Furrow, this woman's boyfriend at the time, or not at the time, this is before they met. So told Lee Furrow uh, under threats of violence that you need to kill Mary Sue. She's talking to everybody. Snitches get stitches. You need to take her out. Um, and apparently this was in like a group meeting and he's like, I'm sorry, son, but your girlfriend's talking. She needs to go. Um, Lee Furrow is going to kill her. So Lee Furrow first tried to poison her. That didn't work. Then, um, he ended up strangling her and dumping her body in a river. That's his murder charge. So the reason why he only spent five years in prison for this is because when Lee Furrow was arrested, he pled guilty and testified against Clarence Ray Allen. So he was only sentenced to five years in prison because he did like a deal where he testified against the, the other guy. And um, that's when she met him was when he was in prison for this murder. Okay. When Clarence Allen was in prison, he hired another guy named Billy Ray Hamilton to kill everyone involved with sending him to prison. So Hamilton ended up killing Brian, grocery store son, and two other random employees that had nothing to do with it. And then when he was arrested, he also made a deal with prosecutors to testify against Clarence Ray Allen. So uh, Clarence Ray Allen is just like ordering hits here and there, freaking everywhere. So four people are dead because of this guy. Clarence Ray Allen was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was executed on January 17th, 2006. And the reason why we went down this side quest is because Clarence Ray Allen was the last person to ever be executed in the state of California on January 17th, 2006. So we went down that side quest to let you know that even if nothing happens in Kevin Cooper's case, the chances of him being executed are slim to none. I hope you guys like that story. <laughs> um, okay, so here's another little tidbit from True Crime Garage. I'm so sorry, PJ, for spoiling your um, 
podcast that you liked, but I went through it with a fine-tooth comb, and they're saying some shit, so... Um, this is their explanation of, uh, so the, the, the whole point is motive. Like why would Lee Furrow kill this family? There's no motive for Lee Furrow to kill this family. This is what True Crime Garage is putting out there. And this is a very squishy, unconfirmed, speculative information. Squishy. Okay, so this information is that the gang leader was Clarence Ray Allen, and he had raised the same kind of horses, the same kind of Arabian horses as the Ryans. Now, remember, they were not only raising horses, but they were training them and showing them as well. Mm -hmm. So there's, like I said, squishy, unconfirmed evidence that Allen may have had previously threatened to kill Peggy Ryan. Why? That, that they had some kind of fight over a horse sale that had gone wrong. That, Squishy. That he he so, felt that he was cheated mm-hmm. um, and that she was, uh, you know, threatened, threatened her life. Okay, let me try to unpack this a little bit. So we have eyewitness that claims that he was possibly in their vehicle the night of the murders, came home roughly a little bit after the night at the time of the murders, came home to change was in overalls was covered in blood. These were never tested. We also have the person that he lived with the girlfriend saying, Hey, and also the hatchet that is the murder weapon, quote unquote, looks kind of like the hatchet that's missing from our house. Uh, also, by the way, we're into horses. He also possibly sold. Well, the gang leader, the gang leader that he was supposedly a member of, might have been into these horses. Right, and this gang that he was involved in uh, also murdered somebody as a gang. So, I mean, it's just how many more things do you need to tie to this guy? Well, there I mean there are there are actually a few more things. So, oh. there there is at least one eyewitness, if not two or three eyewitnesses that claim to have seen three white men at a bar three white at men at some point after the murders and they believed that at least one of them was covered in what appeared to be blood like mm-hmm. had blood okay so um you all know the story that i just told you why on earth okay so um alan clarence ray allen hired lee furrow to kill the Ryan family because of a horse transaction that went bad. Clarence Ray Allen hates Lee Furrow because he testified against him and put him in prison. He had other people who testified against him and put him in prison murdered, straight out murdered. And he thinks, these guys at True Crime Garage think that Lee Furrow is going to kill an entire family, including children, which he thought was three children. One of them survived because of a horse deal that went bad. That's just insanity. What what are they thinking? Oh, man. I'm fired up, guys. Fired up. Okay, so there's a couple of more things that's that they keep going back to. I'm I am going through point by point and trying to explain why what they're saying. And you know what I'm going to do is every single one of these tabs that I have, I will put them in the description after I re-upload this. So if you're watching after the fact, you can go through and watch these um true crime podcasts and You'll be able to debunk them then. You could go into all of their comment sections and start debunking them. It'll be fun. It's great fun. I do it all the time. Um, it's it's much easier. I have, I've been talking for, what, two hours now? And I'm not even close to being done. I'm close to being done. I lied. I'm close to being done. But um, it's too much to put in a comment. But just whatever their main thing is that they're hanging their hat on, you just go through and crush their dreams. It's great. Okay. Okay, so there's two... uh, Everybody who worked on this crime scene, they're trying to make them look bad. So we already talked about the sheriff uh, that stole guns and pled guilty to it. And stealing guns doesn't have anything to do with planting evidence, A. 
the next person is Deputy William Bard. Uh, let's play. Let's play a little Anna Kasparian for you first, and we'll we'll see what she has to say. A lab technician who found shoe print evidence against Cooper was later fired for stealing heroin from the evidence room. It turns out the same lab technician had later planted evidence against another man named William Richards in a separate murder trial. As a result, Richards was wrongfully con convicted and later exonerated. The bloody shirt that was found near the bar did test positive for Cooper's blood. But okay. She's really freaking loud, so my apologies to anybody wearing earbuds right now. Uh, it got me. She got me. So she's confusing two people. She's confusing Deputy William Bard and Officer uh, Daniel Gregonis. She claimed that uh, Officer or Deputy Bard planted evidence in a William Richards case, but that was never... She just made that up. I don't know where, where she got that from. So... Um, Richard or William Bard, Deputy William Bard is the person that discovered the shoe prints on the sheets. Um, and years later, he was caught stealing heroin from an evidence locker. After a thorough investigation, it was found that he w took it for personal use. He wasn't like stealing it and planting it somewhere else or something like that. Uh, not at all. He had a problem. He had a heroin problem and he stole heroin and he used it himself. That's William Bard. Officer Daniel Gregonis worked on the William Richards case. And another side quest, we're going to tell you about Richard or William Richards. This is a shorter side quest, by the way, uh, much shorter. So um, in 1993, so 10, 11 years, 10 years after the original um the murder that we're talking about, you know, with the crimped hair and the, the crimped hair and the fanny pack, that murder, this is in the 90s now. So um, I'm not going to do costume change, maybe next time. <laughs> uh, Gregon has never uh, planted any evidence against William Richard. Def Deputy Bard, or sorry, um, Daniel Gregonis happened to be the technician on a case that got overturned. Pam Richard was strangled and beat to death with a rock on August 10th, 1993. William Richard was charged and convicted of the murder, mainly because there was no evidence that anybody else was there. And he lived out in the middle of nowhere. Like he he lived like way out where you couldn't like walk next door, not like the the lease house and the um ryan residence where you could just walk next door he lived like literally in the middle of nowhere and there was no tire tracks like nobody else had been there according to the police so they're like well you're the only person that's here and your dna is all over her and her blood is on you uh, and his thing was well when i came in and saw her i cradled her body which makes sense you know Either way, his conviction was overturned because they did really didn't have a lot of evidence that he actually did it. Uh, like all his DNA should have been on her. It was his wife, you know. Um, on his appeal uh, of the conviction, it was overturned. Gregonis was the tech who found a blue fiber under the victim's fingernails that was later proven not to be from William's shirt. So one of the pieces of ev evidence that convicted him is there was a blue fiber. He was wearing a blue shirt. Turned out they retested it. It wasn't the same type of fiber or whatever. Uh, they never said he planted. I mean, there was never any in court that he planted it. Uh, the conviction was overturned because of faulty bite mark evidence. It wasn't even because of the blue fiber. It was like part of it, but it wasn't the main reason. Uh, in a civil suit against the county, William said that the blue fiber was planted. This was never proven in court. Gregonis was never charged with a crime. This was just what somebody said, what somebody accused him of when they were trying to get money in a civil suit from the county. That's it. That's the whole thing. End of side quest. Okay. Okay. So, let me go through my tabs. 
I think that's the end of the case. So what do you guys think? Did Kevin Cooper, did he do it? Did he not do it? Was he framed? Is everybody racist? Uh, While you're thinking about that, I'm going to play you a couple of things. Um, Because you need to feel bad for Kevin Cooper. All of these people making these videos feel so bad for Kevin Cooper. Yes, February 10th, 2004. Mm Mm-hmm. My life was on the clock. And that day, I got up, brushed my teeth and all that stuff, you know, drank some coffee, and about eight or nine officers showed up with pepper spray strapped to them and, you know, all this and that, and placed me in a, in a, in a chair. There was all types of food in, the, in, in that room that morning. I mean, it was halfway up the wall with so much food. I guess they wanted me to eat your food is in celebration since it was supposed to be my last day, but mm. I didn't eat your food, and I refused your last meal. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So they took me in the back after I said all my goodbyes to, to everybody, and one group of officers passed me off to another group of officers. And there was like six on each side, and they marched me like maybe 150 yards to the death chamber waiting room. They opened the door. And they marched me in, and then I was in there with the volunteer executioners. Mm. I had waist chains on, and I was handcuffed, and shackles around my feet. And that death chamber waiting room was so cold, it was freezing, and it was mm. like a morgue. See me? Right. So I got the phone from uh, Hold on. Right. No, that's the guard trying to tell me I got five minutes left. I said, no, I got the phone until 5 o'clock. So, Good. So um, they made me strip naked. Mm. And move out into the middle of the floor. Now I'm surrounded by these executioners. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of reading of black history. And almost every book I read, there comes a time when a slave is on an oxen block. And some of them were butt naked. And some of them were, were examined from head to toe and all parts in between. Mm-hmm. And that's what they did to me. They examined my nostrils, my ear holes. They made me open my mouth and stick my tongue out and shine that flashlight down there. They searched my penis and my testicles. They made me turn around and wiggle my toes and then bend over and spread my butt cheeks so wide. And the dude got down on his knees and shine a flashlight up my butt, illuminating my bowels. They say they're looking for contraband, right? Mm-hmm. But they're, just, they're not looking for contraband, in my opinion. They're dehumanizing me further, showing me that my body is not my own that they can do with it whatever they want. That was the most demeaning process I ever went through in my life. And it's your final moments, conceivably, on Earth. But they don't give a damn about that. They don't give a damn about that. And how much how much time do you have now until you're supposed to be executed? Uh, it's a quarter to seven, so I got like, maybe, what, five hours and 15 minutes left or something like that. And I got a big old clock in there. And I'm watching the, the second hand go around. And, I, and my pastor is in the next cage, and I'm listening to her praying for the executioners and praying for me. And you have 60 seconds remaining. And I just stayed there in that cold room, waiting and waiting and waiting. Every time a minute goes by, it brings me one minute closer to being strapped down to that gurney and being tortured with lethal poison and murdered by these people. I also watched the lieutenant take cotton swabs and other things such as that. You have 30 seconds remaining. Alcohol pads and all that type of stuff to that room where the death chamber was. Materials they would use to, to kill you. Yeah, I watched all that. Hey, the phone's already cut off. Let me call you back, all right? Do you guys feel bad? You feel bad yet? I just realized I was blowing my nose with the mic on, so my apologies for that, everybody. Whew. Uh, I knew it was going to happen. I think I called it at the beginning. Um, let me see what you guys are saying in the chat. And then I have a couple of more things that I do want to play for you. Where's the chat? 
I am sorry, I have not really been looking at the chat too much today because it was just a lot and I didn't want to get too distracted. I did glance a little bit at it. I did glance a little bit at it. You guys are great. I'm glad you're here. And I did get a new call-in number. So when it's time, the number is 470-296-0080. I don't know if I, t I tested it out with my own phone, so we'll see if it works. If not, always we can do the Discord or people who have my phone number can call in. Um, I think that it was kind of, uh, oh, my mic was off. Thank you. I appreciate that. I thought I had left it on. Um, oh, my subscribe star says it's under review. Thanks for letting me know, Waffle, Waffle Salter. I did not know that. And um, I didn't. Wow. Yeah, I made that like a week ago. Huh. If you guys want to donate, you could always buy me a coffee. The links are in the description. I would appreciate it if you would like this video. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything to hit that thumbs up button and share it out to people who are who think Kevin Cooper's innocent because I think I went through everything that I've seen people say. Also, if you're watching this after the fact and you have another reason why you think Kevin Cooper is innocent, please put it in the um, comment section and I will look at it. And I mean, maybe you can change my mind or maybe I just... Uh, maybe I know why it's not true and I just didn't cover it in the video. It's a lot. Every time they come out with new uh, stuff, they want more testing. Every time they, um, every time that there is, um, it comes to a halt, they're like, well, you didn't test this or you didn't test that. And some people would think, well, maybe, or it doesn't, it's not going to make a difference, like if Kevin Cooper lives another year or another six months or whatever, but it really does make a difference. It makes a difference to the victims. And I'm going to play you a, a letter right now. This is a letter that Josh Ryan wrote to Governor Jerry Brown when he was asking to have that, uh, the hair tested and the sweat tested. This is the most recent set of tests. I believe it happened in 2019, 2020, um, when they, when it was approved and, uh, the results just came back with them you know, not too long ago. Um, so this is, this is Josh Ryan's words read by my producer, PJ. Governor Brown, I was eight years old. Dear Governor Brown, I was eight years old. I lived on a ranch in Chino Hills with my family. We had horses and I liked to ride and show them. We were a perfect family. Our house was filled with love. It was 1983. I invited my best friend Chris Hughes to spend the night at my house. If I had not, Chris would still be alive today. I blame myself for what happened to him. In the middle of the night, I heard screams coming from my parents' bedroom. I ran towards the screams. I tripped over my sister's body. She was lying in the doorway. The only thing I vividly remember after that is lying in a pool of blood, being unable to move, and looking all night at my mother, who was lying dead beside me. The next morning, I heard banging on the sliding glass door and saw Mr. Hughes and a look of shock and horror on his face that I will never forget. He left, and I heard the front door bashing in and Mr. Hughes in the room cradling his son and sobbing and moaning, which will always echo in my ears. I remember being put in a helicopter. I later learned no one thought I would survive. I tried to escape from Kevin Cooper by not reading the newspaper, but I cannot escape his presence. I tried to get him out of my mind and banish him from my memory, but I cannot escape. People tell me he's on Facebook, puts on a monthly show from his cell in a California prison. I think it is ridiculous that California gives him everything he wants. It gave him the hole in the fence at Chino Prison, which he climbed through to make his escape from prison, which enabled him to murder my family and friend. We know about the hole in the fence because he later bragged about how easy it was to escape. California started subsidizing Kevin Cooper long before Facebook and his monthly talk show when he made his way to my house to murder my family and friend and almost murder me. He walked in shoes supplied by the prison and smoked tobacco supplied by the prison. California has given Kevin Cooper everything he wants. He wants DNA testing, so California gives it to him. It proves that Cooper was the killer, so he says the blood was planted and wants more DNA testing and, for good measure, an investigation of the police for framing him because of his race. Kevin Cooper is a liar. He lies about everything. 
When he is caught in his lies, he lies more and more. He gets other people to believe in and broadcast his lies. Because of Kevin Cooper, I was accused of being a liar on national television. CNN's Death Row Stories put on a show about Kevin Cooper, which presented his many lies as facts, that the police framed him and coached me to lie under oath. Kevin Cooper is in my mind every day. He's in my nightmares, which plays over and over in my head. I can never get away from him. The latest is his request for clemency, something he richly does not deserve, but he does not stop there. He also wants more DNA testing and an investigation of the police and prosecutors. This is ridiculous. This is obscene. Please deny Kevin Cooper's request, but please explain the reason why. It is time someone told the truth about what he did. It is time someone spoke up for me and Chris's family. Sincerely, Joshua D. Ryan. Um, if, if you guys are not tearing up, you have no heart. <laughs> uh, when I, I read this, um, obviously when I was doing research and I sent it to PJ and asked him if he could do, you know, a little voice work for me, because I think having it read in a man's voice is more of an impact. But when I saw it, when I listen to it for the first time even just now i've listened to it probably five times since he sent it to me it gets me every time every time um those are the words of josh ryan he survived this monster named kevin cooper and other people want to give kevin cooper a platform and this is why we need to not give him a platform this is why he needs to sit in a jail cell for the rest of his life. Uh, I understand that California will not put him down like he so richly deserves to be, which he was sentenced to. I understand that California will not do that, but we cannot keep giving him a voice. Kevin Cooper uh, has a radio show on this uh, website called Prison Radio. I'm going to play you a little bit of what he has to say. This is Kevin Cooper, and I'm sending my respects and my appreciation to all of you and to my cultural brother, Lamir Abu Jamal. Everything that is wrong in America is represented in what is wrong with America's criminal justice system. And in the case of Mamiya Abu Jamal, this modern day plantation that has devoured so many poor and minority people that has turned them into modern day slaves must be fought against. If slavery was deemed a peculiar institution back then, when people of that time were considered by people of today as being uncivilized, then this modern day slavery of these times is a very peculiar institution when it is run, controlled, and maintained by people who consider themselves to be civilized. It is up to us, like our abolitionist forebears of yesterday, to speak truth to power. We must abolish the death penalty, life in prison without the possibility of parole, and modern day slavery with the slave wages or no wages paid to prisoners. And to do this is going to take all of us. In struggle and solidarity from death row of San Quentin prison. I'm Kevin Cooper. People keep giving him a platform over and over again. Here's his GoFundMe that they've set up so he can buy honey buns. <sighs> right now it's got $4,201 in it. 99 people have donated to give Kevin Cooper money. 99 people. And I'm sure this is just the most recent one. This is just the most recent one. Um, Kevin Cooper <laughs> does not deserve to have money given to him. Kevin Cooper does not deserve to have a platform. De Kevin Cooper's voice does not deserve to be heard.
This is East Point Peace Academy in association with um, Amnesty International. They, too, gave Kevin Cooper a voice. You have to educate yourself because what happened to me, it happened to you, it can happen to anybody. Absolutely. Um, could you say more about your faith? I, I'm not um, what you might call a religious person. I do not believe in organized religion because of crimes against humanity that they had perpetrated on all people. I mean, as a um, descendant of people who were enslaved in this country, I know that the church, the Catholic church, and damn near every other church, played a part in the transatlantic slave trade as well as in um, slavery within here by the states of America. So what I believe is that God in a spiritual sense, not in a religious, is not a God that believes in the death penalty but does anything to hurt another human being. Most of these people support the death penalty, if you really look at it, or these right-wing religious people, Republicans mostly, some Democrats, but mostly right-wing religious meaning people who believe against their own religion because Jesus Christ did not support the death penalty. In fact, if anybody knows the Bible, they know that when he ran across a woman being stoned for adultery, that was the form of death penalty that she was going to get. He told those people don't do that. And he without sin cast the first stone. This man has never read the Bible. There is the 100-page um, dissent from the judge. And it, it's probably a very interesting read. But I think reading that will definitely help to see guilty or not. Has there ever been a case where the Innocent Project was actually wrong? As far as I know, no. As far as I know, the Innocent Project hasn't gotten it wrong yet. Uh, I just wanted to play that because she's dumb. And I thought you guys should see it. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. One last thing, and then I'll take calls. This is um, Josh Ryan's victim impact statement. I want to know in the chat, as you guys are listening to this, how you feel. It's a pretty long one. Um, again, my BFF and producer, PJ, recorded this for me, and I have the tissues ready. And I would suggest you do the same. The first time I met Kevin Cooper, I was eight years old, and he slipped my throat. He hit me with the hatchet and put a hole in my skull. He stabbed me twice, which broke my ribs and collapsed one lung. I lived only because I stuck four fingers in my neck to slow the bleeding, but I was too weak to move. I laid there 11 hours, looking at my mother, who was right beside me. I know now he came through the sliding glass door and attacked my dad first. He was lying in the bed and was struck in the dark without warning with the hatchet and knife. He was hit many times because there was a lot of blood on the walls and on the side of the bed. My mother screamed and Cooper came around the bed and started hitting her. Somehow my dad was able to struggle between the bed and the closet, but Cooper bludgeoned my father to death with a knife and hatchet, stabbing him 26 times and axing him 11. One of the blows severed his finger and it landed in the closet. My mother tried to get away, but he caught her at the bottom of the bed and he stabbed her 25 times and axed her seven. All of us kids were drawn to the room by my mom's screams. Jessica was killed in the doorway with five axe blows and 46 stabs. I won't say how many times my best friend Chris was stabbed and axed, not because it isn't important, but because I don't want to hurt his family in any way, and they are here. After Cooper killed everyone and thought he killed me, he went over to my sister and lifted her shirt and drew things on her stomach with the knife. Then he walked down the hallway, opened the refrigerator, and had a beer. I guess killing so many people can make a man thirsty. I don't want to be here. 
I came because I owe it to my family who cannot speak for themselves, but by coming, I am acknowledging and validating the existence of Kevin Cooper, who should have been blotted from the face of the earth a long time ago. By coming here, it shows that he still controls me. I will be free. My life will start the day Kevin Cooper dies. I want to be rid of him, but he won't go away. I've been trying to get away from him since I was eight years old, and I can't escape. He haunts me and follows me. For over 20 years, all I've heard is Kevin Cooper this and Kevin Cooper that. Kevin Cooper says he's innocent. Kevin Cooper says he was framed. Kevin Cooper says his DNA will clear him. Kevin Cooper says blood was planted. Kevin Cooper says the tennis shoes aren't his. Kevin Cooper says three guys did it. Kevin Cooper says police planted evidence. Kevin Cooper gets another stay from another court and sends everyone off on another wild goose chase. The courts say there isn't any harm when Kevin Cooper gets another stay and another hearing. This just shows that they don't care about me. Because every time he gets another delay, I am harmed and have to relive the murders all over again. Every time Kevin Cooper opens his mouth, everyone wants to know what I think, what I have to say, how I'm feeling, and how the whole nightmare floods all over me again. The barbecue, the begging to let Chris spend the night, me in my bed and him on the floor beside me, my mother screams. Chris gone, dark house, hallway, bushy hair, everything black, mom cut to pieces, saturated in blood, the nauseating smell of blood, 11 hours unable to move, light filtering in, Chris's father at the window, the horror on his face, the sounds of the front door splintering, my pajamas being cut off, people trying to save me, the wop, wop of the helicopter blades, shouted questions, everything fading to black. Every time Cooper claims he's innocent and sends people scurrying off on another wild goose chase, I have to relive the murders all over again. It runs like a horror movie over and over again and never stops because he never shuts up. He puts PR people on the national television who say outrageous things and then the press wants to know what I think. What I think is that I would like to be rid of Kevin Cooper. I would like for him to go away. I would like to never hear from Kevin Cooper again. I would like Kevin Cooper to pay for what he did. I dread happy times like Christmas and Thanksgiving. If I go to a friend's house on holidays, I look at all the mothers and the fathers and the children and the grandchildren and get sad because I have no one. Kevin Cooper took them from me. I get terrified when I go into any dark place like a house before the lights are on. I hear screams and see flashbacks and shadows. Even with the lights on, I see terrible things. After I was stabbed and axed, I was too weak to move and stared at my mother all night. I smelled the overpowering smell of fresh blood and knew everyone had been slaughtered. Every day when I comb my hair, I feel the hole where he buried the hatchet in my head. And when I look in the mirror, I see the scar where he cut my throat from ear to ear. I put four fingers in it to stop the bleeding, which they say saved my life. Every year, I lose my hearing in my left ear where he buried the knife. Helicopters give me flashbacks of life flight and my incredible hulks being cut off by paramedics. Bushy hair reminds me of the killer. Silence reminds me of the quiet before the screams. Cooper is everywhere. There is no escaping him. I feel very guilty and responsible to the Hughes family because I begged them to let Chris spend the night. If I hadn't done that, he wouldn't have died. I apologize to them and especially to Mr. Hughes for having to find us and see his son cut and stabbed to death. I thank the judge who gave my grandma custody of me because she took good care of me and loves me very much. I'm grateful to the ocean for giving me peace because when I go there, I know my mother and father and sister's ashes are sprinkled there. Kevin Cooper has movie stars and Jesse Jackson holding rallies for him, people carrying signs, lighting candles, saying prayers. To them and to you, I say, I was eight when he slit my throat. It was dark and I couldn't see. Through the night and the day I laid there trying to get up and flee. He killed my mother, father, sister, friend, and started stalking me. I try to run and flee from him but cannot get away. While he demands petitions and claims some fresh absurdity, justice has no ear for me nor cares about my plight, while crowds pray for the killer and light candles in the night. To those who long for justice and love truth which sets men free, when you pray your prayers tonight, please... Remember me. Oh, that's tough to get through. 
Um, that's the end of the show, guys. Uh, I don't even know. I don't even know what to say after that. But uh, I would like to say, if you would like to call in, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do it. You can call my new Google number, which I believe number two just put in the chat. Um, I don't know exactly how this Google Voice works, so if somebody wants to just go ahead and try it, we can do that. Uh, also, you could always do Discord. I'll pull up Discord right now, and if you want to get into the Discord, we can do it that way. And then... We can always do the regular old telephone where I put you on speaker. I know many of you uh, have my phone number, and we could do it that way as well. What did you guys think of that, uh, of um, Josh Ryan's words? I think that they really cut to the chase. That really tells you why it's important to shut this guy down, to not give him what he wants, to uh, ignore him, ignore him. And uh, unfortunately for Josh, I don't think he's going to um, go away, but all right, somebody's calling. Call from number two. Hello, Please number two, you're one. Oh. To send a voicemail, press two. Hold on. Hello, caller, you're on the air? Mic not working. Hold on. Let's see if we can figure it out. Call from number two. Oh my gosh. That did not work. Mic not working. All right. I think it's working now if you want to try again, or maybe I can call you on here. All right, I think I'm doing it. Leave me your name and number, and I'll call you back as soon as I can. Nope. All right, I'm going to talk to Life to the Max, who's on the line now. Life to the Max, can you hear me? Well, this is working out swimmingly. Let's just make sure I have the audio set up. Every time, I think, every time it does this. We will get through it together. Should I? All right, I can hear you. Okay. Aha! All right. Yay. Life to the max. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad you called. Um, Thank you. What do you think of this case? Have you heard of it before? Yeah, no, I have not heard of it before. Um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it happened long time before I was awesome. born, so Never I don't too. know. Um, and yeah, I don't, I hadn't followed these things. Um, but yeah, like, uh, well, to answer your other question of just uh, why is it important, and, or listening to his words, mm -hmm. um, and man, wow, it really, yeah, yeah, I was definitely crying, and it's just, it's yep. more than a slap in the face. N number um, two, I think I have you on the line right now, if you just want to hang out while I talk to Life to yeah, the Max. absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I'll just wait. <laughs> All right, sorry, Life to the Max. <laughs> no, 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 we're good. <laughs> um, but, yeah, listening to his words is very important. And I think I, I thank PJ uh, because he did such a great job with it. I yes. was so moved when I heard that. Yes, absolutely. Are you going to put those out as like other videos? I like am. Videos? I'm going to put yeah. them out as standalone videos. I didn't want to do it ahead of time because I didn't want to spoil the surprise. Um, very good. <laughs> uh, but I do have them uploaded. I just have them privated right now and I'm going to release them. And I want to put, um, I didn't do all the rigmarole with like doing a title and the description and all that. I didn't have time to do that. So I'll get all of that done and uh, they'll be released sometime uh, either tonight or tomorrow. No, no, it's good. It, no, I'm glad you didn't put them out beforehand because, yeah, it just like it really it packs a punch. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I was thinking it's a because like this one and that other case where there are living victims mm -hmm. of the, the killer who killed. Oh, man, it's crazy because of these two people, these two cases, both like multiple uh, murders. Um, and but then there are living victims mm -hmm. and. 
I mean, not only, you know, the people who are, are dead and that's, and that's awful, but like, yeah, this guy, he's being, he's tormented. He's for him though, to say he's, um, his stalker, you know, and, and just, um, the trauma and, yeah. you know, he has these triggers everywhere he goes, these legit, you know, of, and um, the survivor's guilt too. The fact that yeah. he invited his friend over and yeah. when he says, I begged them to let him spend the night, it just broke my yeah. heart. Yeah. Yeah. And then to say also, like, I'm not going to talk about his, um, uh, his, how many times he was stabbed because mm-hmm. his family's here, you know, like, yeah. yeah, that, um, and even though he, he was, yeah, like he was, uh, brutally attacked as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just, that, that poor, that poor boy and that poor man, but yeah. he's still, you know, he's trapped at that at eight years old. Yeah. So. Yeah, and thank yeah. goodness that he had a grandmother that um, was mm. there for him and was able to raise yeah. him and and love yeah. him and get him counseling. I know he was in counseling. He probably still is. I don't know how you get over something like that. Um, right. But right. thank goodness that he had someone to fall back mm-hmm. on. Right, right. He took uh, almost everyone from him, but he still at least had her. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And- and then to hear this other guy, sorry, I'm like, oh, the contrast and like that contrast of hearing um, uh, this, uh, what, Kevin Cooper, his podcast and yeah. stuff, you know, Kim Kardash- Kardashian. It's and, crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. It's awful. And like, what was it? The, he, the way he was talking, I don't know. It reminded me of... The other thing you've been covering, the Daryl Brooks Mm -hmm. case. Like, I don't know. I just see similarities in them of no remorse. It's a mindset. It's definitely a mindset. And they both have it. It's the, I didn't, it's the didn't do. It's the didn't do nothing. I wrote that down. Yeah. 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 And just, and like this, um, this entitlement and everything has been done wrong to me and um 400 years of slavery like yes (laughs) right right it's the racist it's the racist out to get him and now don't get me wrong Mm -hmm. during the original trial there were racists i mean i think i played a little clip of them there were people who are racist who Mm -hmm. were protesting also right i think that takes away i think when you do that whether you're racist or you're not when you do that you lose your point. Those mm-hmm. protester ha- protest- protesters had a good point. This guy slaughtered a family. Yes, right, kill right. him. But when you use language like that, and I understand it was different in the 80s, and you know, and mm-hmm. but when you do that, especially today, you right. lose credibility. So they take that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. They use it against the case, even though it's, yeah, it's a exactly not not the same thing not mm-hmm. equal of like the, the action versus yeah. the words and stuff yeah exactly yeah oh my gosh but yeah that this is um yeah it, it was just really <laughs> it's such an in, it, intense um and just terribly terribly sad so we should have never even heard about kevin cooper it, this happened in yeah. 1983 i should not know kevin cooper's name right? he should have died in 2004 Ooh you know right yeah so why why did he get the stay of ex- execution at the time because of the t- they he they asked for more testing and they were granted oh. more testing his, his stay of execution i know that little clip that i played of him talking to the new york times he was three hours away from being put down three hours yeah, away wow. and the wow. the um, ninth circuit court said all right well we can do the edta testing um and then oh, that came back the so they did was- they did edta testing and then he wanted the hatchet tested now keep in mind this is ridiculous because of two mm-hmm. things first of all edta is on everything secondly mm-hmm. that hatchet 
was was handled by not only the people who were investigating so all the investigators the handle of the hatchet was not protected in any way it was huh. handled in the court there's photos of the um the prosecutor holding the hatchet in the court mm-hmm. it was said uh, there's not photos of it because it's the jury but it was passed around the jury box all of the jury members handled the hatchet by the handle what? so testing the handle to see if Kevin Cooper's yeah. I almost called him Daryl Brooks <laughs> uh, oh. but to see if Kevin Cooper's um, like like here's the they all like they passed it around they felt the weight of the hatchet they they're mm-hmm. testing it was a waste of money and time and then the mm-hmm. EDTA testing also was a waste of time because duh it came back and yes there was EDTA on it there's EDTA on <laughs> yeah. everything. And you know what else is the EDTA? If did you ever watch Making a Murderer? The No. In Making a Murderer, which came out, I don't know, several like 10 years ago now, I think. Um that was another thing is that the blood had EDTA in it and at the time I mm. fell for it. I'm like, "Oh, it came mm. from a vial. They planted that evidence." And then I learned what EDTA was and it's ridiculous. Mm. So, it's in everything. It's in everything. Yep. Wow. Wow. Any closing thoughts? Sorry, I did have another question. Sorry. Yeah. Do we did they Fine. Did do they have like some sort of motive, or what did he say? Or he's just I don't know. Like he's yes. just violent criminal. Uh, well, he has a history of um, breaking into people's mm-hmm. houses and holding sharp yeah. objects to people's throats. Uh, but right, right. Uh, he's never set a motive out of obviously because he didn't do nothing. Right. But in my <laughs> in my opinion, his motive was he needed the car. A uh, and the turns out the keys were in the car. However, he wouldn't have known that. People uh, out in mm-hmm. the country a lot of times leave their keys in their car. If anybody listening, which I know one person that sometimes does this, leaves their keys in their car, stop it. Don't do that. What are you doing? <laughs> Even if it's in your right. garage, don't do that. Put the keys <laughs> in the house. Um, mm-hmm. But I think he knew that if the car was stolen with with them being alive, they would have called it in immediately. And... Um, they would have been looking for the car, which did end up happening anyway. Like they ended up finding out the next morning and they were looking for the car, which is why I think he ditched it in Long Beach and then went to Mexico because it was on the news that they were looking for the car. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I think that in his head, he thought if these people were dead, nobody's going to notice that their car is missing until at least Monday or Tuesday. And it, it ended up being noon on Sunday when the Chris's dad came over to look for his son, but he, Kevin Cooper wouldn't have known that that kid didn't belong to that family, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that's what, that's what I think happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just like, what does, why, like, yeah, just why would he do it at all? And, but yeah, he's not going to say he's a violent criminal and he doesn't think ahead. He thinks right now, this is what I need right now. Um, Mm-hmm. Another thing that they kept saying um, is that he couldn't have, or he he didn't do it because there was money left on the counter, and if he needed money so badly, why wouldn't like if that's uh, his motive to get money? I think because he's not thinking ahead, he didn't he didn't even turn on the lights. And I know that one of the things that he had said in interviews because he did admit to living at that house the lease house Mm. he didn't turn Mm. on the lights there either and the first Mm. night he was there he slept in one of the beds that was there and then he realized all of the bedrooms have windows so he started sleeping in a closet uh because he didn't want people to to see that he was there because he had just escaped from prison he's trying to get the heck away from chino hills because he just escaped from prison in chino hills so i think Mm -hmm. he didn't see the money on the counter or if he did he was in mm-hmm. such a panic after killing these people's that people mm-hmm. that he just took off or whatever so okay um gotcha. that's what i think that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah just uh, one of the steps for him on the run exactly yep yeah Wow. All thank right. well, you thank so you much for much. calling. I appreciate it. Yeah. It makes me sad yeah. when I do a show and nobody calls. 
sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I want to call them. Um, I'm not. Something, By the but, way, you know. all of audience out there, not just Life to the Max and Number Two can call in. You're all welcome to. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah. Do it. People like me. <laughs> exactly. And I want to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> all right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, number Two, are you still there? I'm here. Oh, so this voice, uh, and and I assume people can hear you out in the audience. If you cannot hear number two, please let me know. Uh, I think everybody can hear you. I think that's the way this works. So I'm very excited. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody in Overruled Land. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> everyone. I actually had uh, the Christmas music playing in the background for the next few I weeks. I know. <laughs> it was very nice. It was very nice. Yeah. So um, I have no idea what um you and life to the max talked about just now because my dad is in the other room watching so i couldn't mute that tv so oh, i had to gotcha. go into the other room and wait for the call to start so hopefully so you could only hear my, you could only hear my side of the conversation <laughs> yeah gotcha. yeah okay yeah um, um so what did you think of this case okay um one thing that I don't oh, hold on one second. You... I just want to say one thing to the audience real quick. I see that a, another person has tried to call. I think I know who it is. Um, as soon as we're done with, I can only do one call at a time on this line. I don't think I can have somebody on a hold or whatever. So I will call you back from this number as soon as I am done. As soon as number two and I are done. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Number two. Okay. So um, when I knew you were going to do this case, I watched a couple things on YouTube about it. And one thing, I don't think I rem I was baking cookies at the time, so I don't think that I heard you mention anything about it. You didn't but send me cookies. Grandma, um, maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll look into it. Okay. We'll see if I can make that happen. But. Um, Something that I saw on one of the videos that I watched on YouTube was the grandmother mm -hmm. does not think that Kevin Cooper did it. She believes it was more than one person. Three as white well. men. <laughs> yes. I Which did see that really as well. Crazy. On the 48 Hours episode, but I think, also yeah. keep in mind that that 48 Hours episode was before the most recent testing where the sweat... The, here's the thing. The sweat couldn't have been planted. Also, saliva, where would they get his saliva? So the saliva on the cigarettes was also tested. So the, the cigarette butts were tested and his saliva was on the cigarette butts and also the sweat on the t-shirt. Back then, DNA was not a thing. Not only was it not a thing, these cops would have had to have a premonition of DNA becoming a thing. And then I mean, they could have been witches. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, what's her name? Lee Furrow's <laughs> girlfriend. Um, yeah, that was crazy. Um, but it, it just, it doesn't make sense for it to be, now, I think what, the point I'm trying to make is I I haven't heard from her since that happened, so maybe she's changed her mind since the new testing maybe. has come out. I know. The I other would. thing, <laughs> yeah, really. The other thing that I saw is everything that I saw online about this case is leaning toward the um, opinion that Kevin Cooper is innocent. Mm -hmm. I did not find one video leaning in the opposite direction saying that he was guilty almost everything and that if, is out there is if, like that if you notice it's the same talking points and these talking points were taken over and over from nicholas Kristoff's article in the new york times which i did not read because i don't have to i have 18 thousand book reports on it but uh new york times wanted two dollars a month to read it and i'm not giving new york times money. oh no don't give them any money ever <laughs> yeah so i did not <laughs> I, I don't i didn't read the the article but um his everything that's in his article is from the dissenting opinion from the ninth circuit court of appeals now the ninth circuit court of appeals 
denied his requests. They sided, they did not side with Kevin Cooper. And as you may or may not know, I don't know, but most people know the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is the most left-leaning liberal court in this country. They're famous for being on the side of the criminal. So if mm. they're not on the side of the criminal, one person was on the side of the criminal, and that's where he got his information from. It's so insane. It is just mind-blowing. I did find that one and channel called The Fate of the Union, and like I said before, I'm going to make myself a note to put that in the description, that person's channel. I reached out to him on YouTube because I had no other way to contact him, just in the comments section asking him to contact me because uh, I was hoping mm -hmm. maybe he would call in today. <laughs> uh, but That'd he did not. He, yeah, he didn't respond. So Fate of the Union. Okay. I'll put that link in the description for his channel because he's got some interesting stuff on there. Yeah, it, it's just, it's unfortunate that um, this poor guy has had to live with this in, immense guilt mm -hmm. throughout his life and is constantly being punched in the face at every turn. That's a good way to describe it, yeah. Very sad. I'm glad that he voiced his opinion, though. I'm glad he didn't just fade off into a corner and not say anything. I'm glad he's having his voice heard, even though people are not... If you notice, none of the videos that you probably found on the internet or YouTube or articles or anything even mention Josh Ryan at all, let alone no. put his words out there. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And if they Nothing. do, they poo-poo him away saying he's a liar they're calling him a liar because the cop who interviewed him did not understand what he was trying to say because he could not speak and he, he was said a it child. immediately after once he was able to speak he said it immediately that's not what i was trying to tell you it wasn't three people at night it was three mm -hmm. people that came during the day to ask my dad for work it's just and after going through such a unbelievably traumatic experience mm -hmm. and I mean I can imagine he was in shock for quite a period of time after that oh yeah um, it's it just and then these people trying to discredit him because of the difference in his stories here and there but like you said he came out and explained what he was trying to say exactly so it's yep. just very it's very heartbreaking and then we have good old kim once again trying to be her dad and that's i think what this whole thing is about she's trying to be relevant she's trying she's, to be her dad definitely it's terrible it is it's sickening it really is sickening um so i just have a confession to make I make fun of people for, um, like, when they post a screenshot from their phone and their phone is, like, down to, a, like, 2% or 20%. My phone literally just died because it <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that happen before. Literally down to zero, my phone died. Oh, that's funny. Um, so I'm sorry for making fun of I mean, at least you're being everyone. honest about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so now let's get to the real story. How did people wear their hair, hair like this? Because it's like driving me nuts right now. People used to do this for real, huh? Uh, you were one of them. Was I? Was I, though? Do you we ever... all were one of them. I do, I do have a funny story about hair crimping. Would you like to hear it? It's a little lighter than the topic that we've been talking about. Um, Do you remember several years ago when you came to visit, you crimped the oldest daughter's hair? I do remember. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Uh, that so was fun. When I was a kid, my sister, K-Bot Video, who I have not seen in the chat, but she usually watches the replays, um, mm -hmm. she was supposed to take me to the mall for some reason. It was around Christmas time. It was winter time in Chicago. And instead mm -hmm. of going to the mall, now I had to be, this had to be like 1983. <laughs> like I, I, I was a yeah. kid. And instead of going to the mall, we went to her friend's house, uh, a girl named Chris White. And Chris White crimped my hair. And then mm -hmm. on the way home, uh, my sister, KBOT Video, decided 
that my hair could not go home being crimped because then mom and dad would know that I was not at the mall. (laughs) So what they decided to do was make me get out of the car and they stuck my head in a snowbank to get it wet. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> to get the crimps out of it. And at the time, it seemed like a great idea. Now, looking back <laughs> on it, why would we not just go to a gas station bathroom or something? Hey, and get yeah, or McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> having my hair crimped is a little traumatizing right now. <laughs> I, it's such a weird feeling. Yeah. It, just a weird feeling, that whole so crimp big. situation. It's so big. Yeah, yes, it is. It like double, triples your hair. (laughs) All right. Okay. (laughs) Um, I wanted to let you know my dad thoroughly enjoyed your stream as well. We sat and watched the entire thing, and he's extremely impressed. And am I allowed to say that he is my um, phone a friend person? Sure, absolutely. Uh, number two's dad was a Chicago police officer for many, many years. I don't know how many, uh, but I do want to a thank lot. you, um, Mr. Number Two, for your help with this case. He spoke to me on the phone Mr. for quite number a while. Yeah. Uh, for quite a while yesterday and we went over some of the things in this case Uh, mainly the things that I talked to him about were the procedures about uh, the searches and how you're not going to find things on the first search because the first search is the preliminary search and they don't they're not looking for stuff like that and the other thing we talked about was DNA Um, and the fact that even in a large department like Chicago in 1982-83 DNA was not even a thought in anyone's head no one was Mm -hmm. preserving crime scenes for DNA Uh, especially not in a small town Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing a lot of these people on YouTube are saying is they let people walk in and out of the crime scene and again like the last case that we covered there was a surviving victim so yes The survival of the person is more important than preserving the crime scene. So they are going to let the ambulance people, the the EMTs in to save Josh Ryan's life. They're going to let the helicopter land to try to save his life. Um, It's more important than preserving something that hasn't even been invented yet is what I'm trying to say. Right. But it was great that they actually did end up keeping Mm -hmm. the can and, you know, the Mm -hmm. T-shirts, the can specifically because it had his saliva on it. Oh, yeah. I don't even think I even mentioned that. Yeah, the the beer can that he, he stole the beer. So they're like, oh, he didn't take anything from the house. Yes. He stole the beer, first of all, and a car, Mm -hmm. so he did rob the house. Um, But the can had the victim's blood on the outside, like from where he was holding it, and his saliva on the the lip of the can. So Mm -hmm. how are you going to plant saliva? Like, where did they get the saliva from? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. All right, I think I have one more call, or did you have any closing thoughts, or did you want to say anything? Any shout-outs besides your, your dad? Shout-out number two. Shout-out to my pop. <laughs> Keeping it real. Yeah, I love, I, I know he's <laughs> watching right now. I do, I love your dad, and I appreciate him becoming my uh, pseudo-father figure when my dad passed away. I knew uh, back then if I ever needed anything from a dad, he was the guy I would go to. And he I, loves you. I appreciate that. <laughs> mm-hmm. He loves you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have one more caller for sure. If anybody else wants to call in, I will get you after this next caller. Thank you for calling number two. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. All right. How do I call? Call? Call. All right, we'll see if we can get this next caller on the line. Oh, you got my phone number. What's up there, Katie? Caller here on the air. (laughs) What's 
going on? I was just calling because you were having so many problems. I figured I'd jump in your problems and make it worse, but <laughs> you straightened it out. This is call. This is News Now Enemy, and I appreciate the call. Um, did you have anything, any thoughts on this case? Oh, you did a great job. The only Thank thing you. I was going to say is PJ did an awesome job mm-hmm. reading that. I know. I was, I mean... I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I was kind of like the director and producer. I told him what to say and what to do. So pat myself on the back. No, I'm kidding. I didn't expect it to turn out as well as it did. It turned out so good. It it really tugs at your heartstrings knowing that these are the words of the surviving victim. Yeah, no doubt. What that kid went through and make him go through it over and over Mm -hmm. is just disgusting. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have any doubts that Kevin Cooper is our guy for this one? Or did, did uh, any of the the points of the free Kevin Cooper camp sway you at all? Well, a couple of things. This is the first I've heard of the story. Mm-hmm. But if Kim Kardashian wants him out, he's guilty because she's never defended anybody innocent in her life. Yeah, I think I think you're correct. I think you're correct. That's why I played that little clip of that uh, one e-thought saying that the Innocence Project has never gotten it wrong before. Like, I just about fell on the floor laughing so hard <laughs> when she well, said that. <laughs> she doesn't get anything right. Exactly. All you have to do, you don't even have to dig deep. You just have to scratch the surface a little tiny bit to see the flaws in their case. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Anyway, I got to get going. I just figured I'd call and say this is a great show, and I had to give PJ a thumbs up because that was a great reading. Thank you. I will put his channel in the in the description as well. I think you all should go subscribe to uh, PJ's channel, uh, Wartime Propaganda. I think that's the new channel. Oh, Conspiracy Pilled. Ooh, sorry. Conspiracy. I'll put all of his links. I'll put all of them in the description. So go subscribe to PJ. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I will catch you all later and keep Zed in the basement because it makes the show better when he's not around. (laughs) Thank you. I'm sure he appreciates that. I will talk to you later. I'm noticing in the uh, co- in the live chat over here, he's one of the few that doesn't have a wrench. Maybe if you give him one, he'd fix the channel. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. Thanks for calling. Bye. Take care, Katie. Good talking to you. Bye. I love you. Love Bye. you too. Bye. Okay. So is anybody else thinking that they want to call in? If not, this has been three hours I've been talking now. My throat is a little parched. I did finish... All of my, uh, I'm. this is not a paid promotion, but I was drinking North Arrow coffee and it is delicious. I highly suggest you all go check them out. They're a pro-life coffee company and a bit of their proceeds goes to pro-life charities. I have this blue eye makeup under my eyes. It looks like Mr. Zed popped me in the eye right now. Kind of crazy. Uh, so yeah, North Arrow coffee, definitely check them out. It, it's... Um, it's really good if they do like single source beans and stuff I, d- I don't know what they do but uh it it's worth it definitely worth it um where's my chat there it is let me just scroll through the comments a little bit and then we'll get going if nobody else wants to call. The phone line is open right now. Discord is open as well. And my f- actual phone is dead. So, hold on, I got 5%. Maybe I can turn it back on if somebody wants to call there. I cannot believe I let my phone die. Isn't that crazy? That never happens to me. Um... Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. News Now Enemy, who called in. Life to the Max, who called in. Also number two. I appreciate that so much. I like to hear your thoughts on the case. So if you're watching this after the fact, please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know if there's anything that I missed or if there's a point on their side that I'm forgetting about. I'm really interested to know that. There's a lot of people that think Kevin Cooper is innocent, and I'd love to hear why you think that, uh, especially if it's not something that I covered on tonight's show. Uh, Please hit the like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. I'm almost at 300. I'd love to get to 300 this week. That'd be awesome. Waffle Salter, I appreciate you letting me know about the... um, 
what you call it? What you call it? The subscribe star not working. I had no idea. I just didn't think anybody wanted to give me money. So. <laughs> Uh, just so you know, a lot of these clips that I played um, make it so even if somebody did want to monetize me, I can't be monetized. So any donations are truly appreciated. Uh, Waffle Salter, Life to the Max, Sparky, Major Victory, thank you so much for coming. Uh, wow, I have a lot. I have like a lot of comments to go through. I'm going to watch the replay and read all of your comments just because I did not uh, really look too much at the chat while I was speaking, like I said before, but I do want to hear what you guys are saying. If it's something very important, please, once this re-uploads, comment on the video and I definitely see all of those. It looks like nobody else is looking to call in right now, so I'm going to end it. And that means I need to have my music ready. Playing us out of the stream today is going to be No Nothing Music as usual. Uh, I'm going to have a song that's going to be the same song every time very soon, probably in the next two months. But until then, here's Dust Yourself Off by No Nothing Music. Links in the description. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye. Dust yourself off, make yourself move around. You'll have a fine time, get over how you're doing now. Walk in the fine line, just focus on improving. Gotta change up the still frame shot to a motion picture. Just dust yourself off, make yourself move around. You'll have a fine life, get over how you're doing now. Walk in the fine line, just focus on improving. Gotta change up the still Picture you gotta get up. There's work to be done. Paint your face, get ready for the circus, son. Change your pace, don't wait until the curtains shut. You can't stay in one place, we're all imperfect. You gotta get up. Here come the set and sun. Raise a blaze, take it through the day with certain cuts. Change your ways, baby, make yourself a servant, son. Your lace and get frayed before your circuit up. Just stop thinking bad thoughts, then repeat it. You got that hunger for some fault, so you feed it. You know the devil's voice is always misleading. You gotta go, gotta go now. Just dust yourself out, make yourself move around. You'll have a fine time, get over how you're doing now. Walk in the fine line. Still frame shot to a motion picture Just dust yourself off Make yourself move around You'll have a fine life Get over how you're doing now Walk in the fine line Just focus on improving God change up the still frame shot To a motion picture Just dust up the still frame shot To a motion picture You gotta get up There's work to be done Save the for anyone This ain't a game It's a struggle But it sure is fun You can't stay in one place We're all we're perfect You can't stay in one place We're all we're perfect You can't stay in one place Stay in one place Just stop thinking bad thoughts Then repeat You got that hunger for some fault So you feed it You know the devil's voice is all
still frame shot to a motion picture just dust yourself out make yourself move around you'll have a fine life get over how you do it now walk in the fine line just focus on improving gotta change up the still frame shot to a motion picture just dust yourself out make yourself move around Just change up the still frame shot to a 